Ego takes the wheel. They both snap! Oh my gosh! Everybody, welcome to coverage of the Infinity Gauntlet, a Marvel Snap Invitational. I'm Maria Bartholdi, joined by Mani Davuti, and we've been having a great time in this tournament going through the matches. And today we are kicking it off with stuff in the winner's bracket, round number two. Let's take a look at our bracket and find out what's already happened so far in this tournament, Mani. It's been great. Yeah, it really has. Just getting to see it, some names that we have seen across all card games battle it out and go head to head in marvel snap has just been a lot of fun and seeing names that you and i are very familiar with like yes. kibler and hoogland uh it, and names that we're not so familiar with like casanova or dara uh battling it out has just been a lot of fun there's been cool decks the format of bringing two decks one for the winner bracket one for the lower bracket it, it's all just made for a really sweet viewing experience Absolutely. And the players are starting things off with today are feeling pretty good coming off a win in round number one. Let's find out who will be watching here. We've got Jeff Hoagland versus Specimen. This is Jeff Hoagland playing a super sweet bounce deck, Monty. I love this deck. Yeah, this deck is really cool. You're not seeing the normal Zabu style Darkhawk decks that we have seen in the past. Instead, you see Jeff Hoolin is really trying to maximize the power of Beast and Falcon uh, to abuse these enter uh, on reveal abilities like Korg, like Black Widow, uh, and that's how you keep the size of your Darkhawk up. There's also Bishop, which has always been extremely powerful with this bounce style deck that features Beast and Falcon, and just cards like Mysterio and Bass that give you a lot of value. So this deck is very cool at what it does, and it feels like Jeff has really come with a plan here for the winner's bracket. Absolutely. This deck's a blast to play, everybody. If you haven't tried it yet, I highly recommend it. Going up against Specimen's garbage list. And that's not me just calling it garbage. It just literally is about making garbage money. Yeah, it really is. The deck is really cool from Specimen. It almost feels like a hazmat deck, but it's not playing hazmat. You see cars like Debris, Viper, Green Goblin, just trying to give your opponents things that don't matter, uh, and then taking advantage of them with cars like Spider Woman. Uh, one of the things that is a bit concerning for me for Specimen is Specimen is hoping to create a board that will stay there uh, and clog things up from Jeff Hoogland's side. Jeff has cards like Feast, Beast and Falcon that are really going to disrupt this game plan. Yes, it is going to fill up his hand with a bunch of garbage, uh, as is the name of the deck, but that's better than being on the board and clogging up board spaces. Jeff will then get to pick and choose what he wants to replay. So it's really interesting that we're seeing two what feel like off meta decks here going up against each other, and yet there's still a bit of an advantage going to one of the off meta decks all the same. Yeah, this is going to be really awesome. Let's head on down to the game. All right, here we go. Jeff Hoagland and Specimen here in the winner's bracket. Winner gets to keep playing. Loser drops down to the loser's bracket and we'll have to switch to their second deck, the Icebox. The first location here, Iceman for Jeff Hoagland. Yeah, you do see Ice Boss hitting the hood from Specimen, so being deprived of a turn one play. Uh, now, it would have been nice to curve that hood into a Viper, but instead you can just take advantage of Oscorp Tower here in Specimen's seat and give the hood over if you want. And here we see Jeff Hoagland snapping right away. We saw this a lot from him in round number one, just, con just very confidently snapping early on in games. Yeah, already we see the Falcon being played, picking up the Ice Man. You're hoping to use Falcon plus Ice Box to really just uh, hit the cards in Specimen's hand and prevent Specimen from being able to make the plays that he wants. The Beast's follow up is in hand as well to create that bounce chain alongside Bishop. One of the interesting things here is it, <laughs> this is open deck list, so both players know what the other player is up to, and Specimen knows it's better if I just get out of this ice box game before it costs me too much. Yeah, it was too cold for Specy there. Jeff Hoagland picking up the win on a retreat from Specy here in game number one. Repeatable Iceman seems pretty bad for him. <laughs> here we go. Pretty darn strong. 
<laughs> Cave number two, Plunder Castle, the first location asked for Hoagland. Yeah, Plunder Castle, not really great for either player. Hoagland does have an America Chavez in his deck. So oh, look at he... another staff. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You yeah. see a location that only you can play to. Specimen cannot play this to, to this location. Jeff is looking at open deck list and knows that there are zero six cost cards in Specimen's deck. Now, Jeff needs to be careful about potentially playing an Iceman and giving Specimen a six card card in Spider Woman or oh, that's Arrow. That's true. That's true. But otherwise, he should be able to prevent Specimen from fully playing to that location. Now, Los Diablos base being turned up means that potentially 50 50 here if this snap from hoogland may be a bit aggressive but jeff is still very much enacting his game plan so i don't think he minds too much at the moment all right so we filled up los diablos to get it bounced back to our hand with beast there for hoogland green goblin into the cloning fats for spessy ah oh, that's kind of fun and a widow's bite to get that out of hand here goes los diablos taking out the plunder castle all right all right, so that's no free win for Jeff Hoogland in one lane because knowing that you're guaranteed to draw the America Chavez as long as your hand is not full, Jeff felt confident that that lane was going to be won. That's no longer the case. Still able to deploy everything here. We do see with the hood and Darkhawk in hand, this stats is going to give Jeff a lot of additional power. Of course, raising the base stats on Darkhawk, you'll still get that ongoing ability. So this is very strong for Jeff right now. And on the other side, Specimen is feeling the pressures of continuous Black Widows. Yeah, we saw Jeff uh, have some Black Widow shenanigans in round number one too, keeping the opponent from drawing any cards. It was beautiful slash horrific. Uh, however you feel, depending on the seat you're sitting in at any given moment. There comes the Hood and Green Goblin, number two for Specy. Korg, like we saw Jeff playing there into the cloning vats. Black Widow's going to fire off another Widow's Bite into Specy's hand and Bast. Coming back for Hoagland to pump up his cards. Yeah, you can really see why this deck from Jeff is so darn annoying. Between the rocks in the deck, the Widow's Bites in the hands. It you're just being constricted on all sides. On the other hand, Specimen is trying to constrict Jeff's board space, which right now is annoying, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah, it's interesting. Both of these deck trying to annoy the opponent on different axes. <laughs> uh, a Darkhawk into cloning vats for Hoagland, and Darkhawk's just such a great card in Jeff's. Yeah, it really is. We see currently Specimen has eight cards in deck which means that this dark hawk is a 19 power four cost card uh of course that is going to get shrunk a little bit uh the following turn but i believe uh jeff is playing a korg here so once again that, that is going to continue putting more garbage in specimens deck, creating worse draws potentially and is this a snap Spessy. back from yes. Specimen? Wow. Specimen snaps back here. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's see what happens this turn. Korg coming off here for Hoagland, followed by the Hood with three power. There's that enormous Darkhawk adding 21 into the cloning vets. Killmonger is flipping over there for Specy is going to be on cleanup duty. Widow's Bite out of hand, followed by a demon into the vats is going to give Specy another demon in hand. Yeah, Jeff has demons of his own, uh, thanks to the hood that was played the previous turn. So Jeff can just play a Darkhawk into the left lane if he wants, demon into the right lane, uh, or just go for Mysterio. And it, this feels like it's going to be very problematic for Specimen. Yeah, that Darkhawk, again, being copied from Cloning Vats for Hoagland is a lot of power, but Spessy felt confident, Monty, with, on that last turn with that snap. How do you think he feels now? Well, he does have this arrow, but I feel like he has to believe that this arrow is not good enough, knowing that there is a second copy of Darkhawk coming down. Yeah, absolutely. He definitely knows about that because of the vats. Yeah, so the question is, what can Specimen do uh, with six mana to work with, Arrow or Spider Woman plus Demon look to be your best options, but knowing that your opponent is going to try to go wide, can this do anything? Hooglin does have the priority here, so we'll be flipping first uh, with this Mysterio and Darkhawk. 
Bessie going through a couple of different iterations, finally landing on the choice here for this final turn. There comes Darkhawk, there goes Mysterio for Hoagland. We've got eight cubes on the line. Spider Woman was the choice for Specimen here into the cloning bat. And there is the demon. Wow, Jeff Hoagland taking down this game and that Specimen's life completely defeat depleted. Hoagland takes this down in short order, continuing on to fight more here in the winner's bracket. Is, is, is that nine or was that the full 10? It, I think Specimen may have retreated the first game. It, we can't see from this view. Yeah, Specimen has one life left. Oh, he's so got one life left. It is sneaky. It's hiding off screen. So neither of us could see it at first, but it does look like Specimen just taking a moment, using the time to review this game before going to the next one. Uh, Chip into chair, Maria, as they say in Chip poker. In Specimen chair. is not out yet, but considering <laughs> the most damage you can deal to Jeff Hoogland is one at a one. time, this is going to be a grind to come back if you're Specimen. Yeah, you can't bet more life than you have, or indeed more chips than you have here, and Specy's just got one. Quantum Tunnel revealed here is going to be potentially a fun location if the players want to play there, but they've decided to both play their hoods somewhere else. Yeah, neither of these decks are particularly Quantum Tunnel decks. Uh, <laughs> Specimen might be in a position where he would want to normally snap, seeing that the opponent has a hood uh, in the Superflow. Unfortunately, knows that Jeff is able to play cards like Falcon and just remove that hood anyways. And thank you for the free hood, Mr. Specimen. I'm going to make use of that, says Jeff Hoogland. And... This just seems like a really, really rough matchup for Specimen. Absolutely. Falcon scooping everything up, giving access to that mana once again for Hoagland. Green Goblin's going to try and shut that down, though, for Specy. There's Bishop, one of the huge cards from the stack. Hood into the tunnel, and Darkhawk comes out. <laughs> and now the tunnel is shut down. Los Diablos' face blows it up into the stratosphere. Yeah, really destroying the tunnel behind you. Smart move from the Darkhawk. Doesn't want anything yeah. to follow him uh, out that. of there. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> There's Bast and Demon for Hoagland this turn, and it is his game. Yeah, Bass is a super solid draw here as well. You have the hood in hand. Of course, you do have uh, a, another demon in your hand that you would like to preferably play before the Bass is able to do it. Uh, could just skip out on Bass for now. Of course, you do see the Beast uh, picking nice. up the Green Goblin here uh, for Jeff Hoogland saying, I, I don't really want this on my side. You can have it back maybe in a future turn. Oh, that's great. Beast is certainly making his name known in this game. Shang-Chi taking down that Darkhawk and the runes are for Bessie. Oh, uh, and the Black Widow here. Jeff has the choice of saying this is all you work with for the rest of the game if he wants, but I think he could just go demon, demon, uh, Green Goblin and be pretty happy with the amount of stats and, uh, and an extra one thanks to Beast picking up Green Goblin, making it cost two. Uh, the Bass as well, just so much to work with here. And what does Specimen do? Yeah, it looks really, really bad for Specy though. He's looking great. Always bringing the fashion for us. <laughs> he brought it. He brought it the first weekend. Bringing it this weekend too. Thanks, buddy. Uh, but it's uh, gonna be a tough road to climb here. There goes Green Goblin. Get your own Green Goblin. Here you go. Hold this. Bishop <laughs> being pumped up too is just insult to injury. Yeah, Jeff really doing the ultimate form of regifting, giving that Green Goblin back to its <laughs> owner. <sighs> This debris would normally be maybe good filling up one lane from Jeff Hoogland, but Jeff still has two lanes to play with. And more importantly, that Bishop is growing. You're dominating in stats in every lane. What is Specimen doing here? Yeah, and we've just got a giant America Chavez we can put down wherever we want if we're Hoogland. Yeah. Oh, he's gonna, <laughs> yeah. Berg is right, Specy. There's Chavez. All right, we're going to try our best here with Spider-Woman to win the ruins. There's Demon Superflow, but it is not enough. And that is the final nail in the coffin there. Jeff Hoagland taking down Specimen. Thumbs up from Specy. Well played in this tournament. You are now heading down to the loser's bracket. So he's not out of it just yet and gets to switch to his second deck, Monty. Yeah, he does. And I 
didn't catch Jeff's first match in the winner's bracket, but this deck is looking really impressive from him. I know that players have tried to various degrees of success to make a Beast Falcon deck work in the past, but this iteration from Jeff, whether it was this matchup specifically or just the deck itself, looks really strong, and Jeff did some very impressive things there. Absolutely, and I'm excited even more once Kitty Pride hits our collections to see how this deck evolves from there. All right, everybody, more Snap from the winner's bracket coming up. This episode of the Infinity Gauntlet is brought to you by BCW Supplies, our go-to source for protecting our prized collectibles. From cards to comics to coins, BCW Supplies has top-tier options to store, protect, and show off your rarest gems. Head over to bcwsupplies.com and use the code ISP10 to get 10% off your entire order. BCW Supplies. Protect. Store. Display. We're at the Infinity Gauntlet, presented by 983 Media. We're still in the winner's bracket right now. And who else could I possibly be joined by right now? It's Ben Brode. Ben, I, I can't even begin to speak how awesome it is to have you here right now. I, I'm super excited for this match. I'm psyched! I'm so excited to be here! And what an exciting match! Uh, did, did you think that Marvel Snap was going to come to this kind of spot? <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, you know, we're, just, we're trying to make a cool video game every day, and then, you know... Someday it comes out and people will enjoy it. That's cool. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're doing right here right now. We have Kibler versus uh, Freddy coming up in this next one right here. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the decks list for this one. Kibler is oh. going to be on Thanos for this match. And nothing really super stand out here. It's really just pretty much the premier Thanos deck that you expect to see. One of these very powerful decks that's been around for a while now. It uses Lockjaw, the Infinity Stones that you get from Thanos in this one, and try to power out some mega powerful stuff here. But if you look over at Freddy's deck list, Ben, I'm seeing a lot of really cool little cards here that are trying to really take advantage of what your opponent can do and how well you can predict what they're doing. Yeah, there's some, there's some interesting stuff here, right? There's a lot of interactive things like Cosmo and Shang-Chi. It's also got, uh, you know, Zero, which is you know, taking advantage of some of the negative side effects here of cards like Lizard and Titania but, uh, and, and, and Maximus. But uh, it's also got Killmonger, so, <laughs> you know, you have, to, you have to be careful about how you're playing Zero and Titania when you've got Killmonger in your deck. Yeah, we got Spider-Woman in here as well to take advantage of full lanes. And then Red Skull in here, no Shuri. On yeah. the Red School, just says, you know what? This is five energy for 15 power. Sign me up. No Shuri, no Sauron. Yeah, none of that stuff. It's just a lot of big, powerful stuff. And Freddy, I think, demonstrated in their first match exactly why these kinds of strategies can be very powerful, especially if you have Daredevil, so that you don't have to predict anymore. You can just see what your opponents are going to do. So without further ado, let's get into Kibler versus Freddy. All right, here we are. It's the opening game for this one. And let me tell you what, Battle Mode has been, I think, the way to introduce the game. Ben, how did y'all come up with Battle Mode? Well, uh, we we knew we wanted a way to play, you know, 1v1 Marvel Snap. And we if you just, like, play a game of Marvel Snap, the, the snapping doesn't matter, right? Because it's about winning or losing. So we needed a way for the snapping to matter in 1v1. And the only way to do that is to have a series of games where the stakes have some impact. And, you know, at that point, it was basically, you know, this is the way to do it, right? This is the way to, to make stakes matter. And I think it stakes matter more here than, than even on the ladder. Oh, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with you right now. We're competing for a $3,000 prize pool in this one, uh, which I want to note, uh, I believe, is, is $862.50 goes to the winner on that one. It's an evenly distributed prize pool across all 16 players for this Invitational. So nothing crazy going on, just a Quinn's Jet on uh, oh, a, that's a Mojo World. Draw, though. That's like the draw you want most in the whole Thanos deck, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I'll take I'll take free energy anytime I can get it. That's like the draw I want in every deck. Did they just keep playing the Mojo World here over and over and over? Uh, I, I'm curious when when that eventually deviates. You know, for Freddy Babes, I'm looking at Killmonger in hand, so you can definitely take advantage of that. I kind of let Kibler play yeah. in the Mojo World a bit and then try to find a way to swing the turn there. 
But what I've noticed from Freddy's play is that Freddy has been pretty sweaty across the matches as well, like super hyper focused, like is trying to figure out every single little thing that can really matter in these kinds of games. And Kibler, I, I feel like, you know, having the integrity that Kibler's had in card games so far, he tends to play with intuition and he tends to use what he just likes. Now, if there's a deck as powerful as Thanos is, you're going to use Thanos a lot of times. So from Kibler's side of things, now that we're in the second round, these are open deck lists. Players know what their opponents are playing against. But so far, so, you know, at this match right now, Kibler's just kind of, you know, draw my cards and I'm playing my cards. Really, what, what, else, what else can I really do at this point? Well, he's, he's playing all of the cards he can to, to make sure that he gets a great drop out of Sakar here, which is reasonable. But uh, uh, Freddy doesn't have the same options to do that. He's got a lot of... And, and pulling Shang-Chi here or Killmonger, uh, really, like, you know, Killmonger's not bad. Oh, there's a snap from yeah, Freddy! Freddy! Yeah, Freddy's going to snap early here. And you can see the focus on that. I mean, that's just kind of exactly how I expect Freddy to be playing here. There's a lot of options open. And yeah, Kibler... Looked like oh, that. Kibler wanted the retreat. He wanted the retreat. Did you see that? He had the menu up. He was hoping to do it. He just waited too long. Dude, he was. And Freddy, you notice Freddy didn't play anything here. They wanted the options to be minimized onto Sakaar. Like, they, they didn't want to pull a specific card. I mean, Maximus gets pulled and you put up with Devil Dino in play. That's yeah. a terrible looking effect. <laughs> Maybe Kibler's happy he didn't get the retreat off. <laughs> just what it's it's uh it's having the boomer hands you're like oh i couldn't quite retreat in time oh <laughs> nice <laughs> thanks ben brode <laughs> look we've yeah, known for Dino's... years that you're pulling the levers on these all right yeah all right yeah devil Dino's big you know it's what it's it's nice i think you know your opponent's got shang chi here i don't know if you if you suspect that or not but you've got uh multiple places where you have giant cards so hopefully uh, he's going to shang the shang chi to the car there yeah a bit of a risky play from freddy so again it being open deck list really the only card that shuts us off from from killer side is armor and you can see killers anticipating that he's like i don't want to lose my biggest thing in play and this also wow. protects the sunspot oh nice from a killmonger there so that is oh, completely that's... shut off <laughs> that's rough how's it how is freddy coming back from this well that's a great question the, the the turn five at least before he decides <laughs> Yeah, this is looking like it might end up being retreat here because Kibler, I imagine, with this hand, you're looking at Arrow, you're looking at She-Hulk, you're looking at five energy. This feels like a, well, here you go. You're you're kind of telling Daredevil what you're doing. Anytime you, you skip five energy, it's pretty obvious that there's likely a She-Hulk sitting in the hand. Yep. And he's got Infinite. It's a big, that's a big turn six. Sunspot gets a lot of energy and you get She-Hulk and Infinite. Yeah, you, you, you have and options you don't too. Get, and you don't have to tell your opponent... <laughs> <laughs> where you're going either, which is where Daredevil normally tells you exactly where and you're investing your resources. Yeah. Could be like She-Hulk plus a stone plus Shang-Chi. Could be Arrow plus She-Hulk. Could just be Infinite. Could just be a bluff from Kibler's side. Maybe they don't have any of those cards. And they're saying like, so, yeah. So he's staying in. So which means he's got, he's like hoping the Killmonger clinches Mojo World, right? And then maybe Arrow gets him Monster Island with that, with that. Uh... But that's not enough. Yellow Jack is not enough. To make that happen. Well, you have Arrow plus a play next turn. So yeah, if you kill Monger now, that's that locks up the left side and it evens the middle at this point. God, there's a oh, lot right. of stuff. This is a really tough turn. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with Arrow, you have so much control over what your opponent's last turn is going to look like. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised that Kibler is not snapping here with how powerful th uh, that Kibler's hand is right now. Well, he knows his opponent has Killmonger and Arrow, right? If he knows that, he knows just how little control he's going to have over the last turn. Oh, we just went with Killmonger. Interesting. I think the intent is to zero the Yellow Jacket there. Oh, he can do that last turn, right? He's got the energy to do it. Oh, but he didn't... Uh, he won't be able to play zero and Titania and Arrow. He can play zero Yellow Jacket Arrow? That looks like the intent here. Oh, maybe it's not. Oh, Freddy. I think Freddy's cooking up something here. I'm really curious to see what this is. Is he just playing Yellow Jacket? Yeah, he's got kid. That's like... <laughs> what is oh, happening? it's definitely not just Yellow Jacket. <laughs> he looked like very satisfied after he dropped the Yellow Jacket. I was like, wait a second. That doesn't... <laughs> oh. It says Arrow isn't going to be good enough here. Oh, wow. So if... if, if uh... Man, if Kibler just reads that it's not he's not going to Mojo World, he could take Mojo World this turn with uh with She-Hulk and another card, right? 
There's also the option. Car locked up. Yeah, there's also the option of She Hulk in the middle with arrow to the left from Kibler's side. So you're just pulling everything in the middle. You just concede Mojo World, take the sec- center location and the right location. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of options here. This is kind of what I mean. Like, but when you get to these turns and all this crazy, wacky stuff is available, it's really hard to figure out what you should or shouldn't be doing. <laughs> yeah, especially with arrows on both sides, right? Who's got uh, initiative? Freddy? So his arrow is going to go off first? Yeah. It's pretty good. Arrow to Mojo World is going to lock that up. And then he's going to win the tiebreaker. Wow. And that's because the, the left location is full, so arrow has no effect. Wow, that is a great play from Freddy. Yeah, incredible. Minus four Ooh, I, cubes. I, was, I felt like uh, Kibler had that in the middle there with that armor against Shang-Chi, but... Uh, Really incredible play by Freddy there to, to keep it alive. Yeah, I was thinking so too as well. It's it's the having that the initiative going into that final turn was was all the difference. If it's arrow versus arrow, it's the you want you want the first flip. Yep, hundred percent. You get you get a lot more control that way. I'm not gonna. Wow, his face his face did not look like a, I'm gonna snap right now face, but I guess it was. It was <laughs> turn one snap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kib oh. Kibler, Kibler knows. <laughs> <laughs> he knows when you're behind, you gotta you gotta take a little bit more risk. So it's like, yeah, no, let's, you know, let's it's, pump this up. It's interesting, right? Like playing your cards in the right locations is hard and uh, very very good, right? If you're better at that, you're gonna win more games. But also just recognizing when you can scrape a cube away with an aggressive snap. Where's another <laughs> one? Another turn one snap. Honestly, I think this is strong recognition here from Kibler as well. Now, again, I've known Kibler for years at this point, and he's a player who plays very much intuitively and will try to take advantage of what he thinks his opponent's weaknesses are. Freddy's deck is meant to take advantage of the evolving state of the game right now, to use these tools in the right situation. So if Kibler's hand is powerful, and he thinks that Freddy's is not going to be consistently powerful. Again, it evolves as the game goes on. You can scrape these free cubes. Yep. Well, Freddy bought that one, so we're, we're playing a high-stakes game here for two cubes right now. If it goes all the way in, it'll be four cubes, which is, which is like, good. if, if Kibler loses this game at the end, he's going to be left with two cubes. And you yeah. can't deal more damage than you have remaining health. So that's a long path. At this point, he's either got to retreat before six, or he's got to hope he really wins this one. And he's got a lot of stones here. He's got all the stones. He's missing one. A lot jaw shows up too. Missing one. Yeah, I will say that the the uh, the collapsed mine I feel like hurts Kibler quite a bit. It does have infinite though, so if you can if you can take advantage of Lockjaw here, and then skip your five and have infinite, maybe that's a way you can get out of this. Oh yeah, if you're planning on skipping five anyway, it's not uh, it's not that big a deal. Now we also have Killmonger here from uh, Freddy, so it could be <laughs> could be the rocks just disappear from that. Although he's he's mining away the rocks right now. Yeah. Way. Oh, it's interesting. Do you want to play Killmonger to clear all these uh, stones or, you know, and, and risk clearing the rocks with them? Felt like to me that Killmonger was was definitely a tool. So if you want to unlock like a zero titania option, if you just want to, you know, blow up a bunch of stones and get some stuff in play. But I, I mean, the camera, I think, says everything from Freddy's side here. It's like you got to cook up every <laughs> single play imaginable. <laughs> And figure out what to do here. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> He's thinking hard. Yeah, to say the least. Well, you know, when your deck is so tuned to respond to what your opponent's going to do, you have to get in their mind and figure out what they're going to do. Here goes, there's the last stone. It's a good change. And Power Stone gets played. So that... Oh! <laughs> The big one. Wow. That's a, full, this, that's a full stone Thanos right there. This turn is actually really interesting from Kibler's side as well. So Kibler has initiative, has priority, whatever whatever we're going to call it right now. I guess we could get the official term here from Ben right now. Is it is it called initiative or priority? I usually say initiative. Okay. Yes. No, well, we're just going to go with initiative. Ben Broda has declared it here. It is initiative. If you're saying priority, you are incorrect. <laughs> Uh, you know, did he leave the rocks up just to make sure that the Bifrost didn't like shove everything out of out of position here, and still gives him the opportunity to break the rocks on the last turn and then uh, play to that side? 
it, that I think that's like an unintended consequence of the action here, but it's something that it looks like Kibler clearly took advantage of. So the other thing here is with the time stone that Kibler had played in the previous turn, he's going into turn six with a zero cost She-Hulk and an Infinaut. Oh, wow. That's pretty good. And the rocks will be cleared because he will have skipped his turn. Yeah. Killer's in a mm. great spot, I think. Uh, is Power Stone, I know like internally we went back and forth on this. I can't remember. It's ongoing, right? So Killmonger's going to blow up the extra power for the Thanos? That is an excellent question, actually. So what we're going to do is we're going to reference the internet for this one. <laughs> Killmonger goes off. We'll find, we're going we're to find out right now. It is yeah. ongoing. So there, there it goes. Wow. There's not much left on the board here. And I will say this could be a tougher spot now because uh, Freddy Babes now has initiative on this one. So and the arrow. arrow is boasting a hefty effect. Yep. How yeah, does Killer I mean, recover from that? If you go arrow to the middle, that's uh, that's it unless you play more than... But more than two cards. Yeah, so I think I think that uh, that turns off Infinaut from Kibler's side. Yep. Oh, he's playing uh -oh. it, but he doesn't look he doesn't look happy about it. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, Kibler's saying that this this is the uh, the clasp the hands and and pray to Brode. <laughs> like no arrow, please. Oh, there you guys. Oh, this is not looking good for Kibler. Oh here. no. Uh -oh. oh no! <laughs> yeah, and Kibler knows. He knows that, that that is a risk that is oftentimes going to be worth taking. It secures the game otherwise if Arrow is not there. That's minus well, four more keys for Kibler. This is like the you got to win two out of three, but you don't have to win two out of three by much here. It's just <laughs> the smallest, the smallest victories here on those two other locations. Look how wow. stressed Freddy's as well. Health left for Kibler. He has to win a lot of games in a row here. Yes. A lot of them. And Freddy, we saw like the relief of stress that Freddy had in that game. And I really think that's like such a, a good point to bring up too, is like talking about the locations and how you just have to win two of them. It doesn't matter how much you win by. It's like your deck doesn't have to do everything. Your deck has to do enough. And it yeah. feels like Freddy, Freddy Babe's deck is definitely doing enough. Okay, this is it. This is the final game. Kipper snapped and Freddy accepted the snap. So they're, they're all in. Kipper's all in now. It's potentially oh, the Thanos. final game. Potentially the final game. He's not happy about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But Kibler has a lot of a lot of six drops, and he's got the guaranteed America Chavez on six. So, <gasps> oh, oh that is huge. Oh, he's got the killmonger. He's got the killmonger. That's a commitment of three energy at some point, though. Hmm. Kibler's got a space stone here as well. So even if the sunspot ends up getting blasted away by Killmonger, you're going to have the option from Lockjaw and space stone to move something else there. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's, that's pretty good. That's hard. You can't, you can't arrow that away either. Cause it's some, you know, arrow doesn't take moved cards that turn. It takes the cards that were played that turn. Cosmo, that would turn off space stone. <laughs> Kibler's got a uh, initiative though. He does. He does he have? He doesn't have space stone this turn, does he? I, I didn't. I don't remember which one. He yeah, had, he, had uh, he had space stone, soul stone, and power stone in hand this turn. Wow. Yep. Like this is like the premier lockjaw turn you can have. Yep, and uh, and that's gonna lock him out of Sokovia, right? He won't have any more cards to play. Oh, except he can move a card. Yeah, I think Killmonger's the play. So this is great for Killer. I think at this point, unless three stones came up, oh! I think this is great. Good cards here. Oh, wow. Oh, well, that takes away some of the options for Freddy there. So there's a Killmonger. The armor protects the Time Stone. So from Kibler's perspective here, he can literally just move the Time Stone over. And he's got another Space Stone! <laughs> My goodness. Holy smokes! What do you move here? You move Lockjaw or Time Stone? It's not giving them the option to move. So once again, I'm going to reference the internet here. Or maybe we, oh, we just don't see the option to move. We're looking at Freddy's yeah, yeah. perspective. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm crazy. I see it floating at the at the top 
on Kibler's perspective on the top side. Oh, I can see Kibler looking at the deck list right now. You see him looking over at the other screen? He's going, wait a second here. <laughs> it matters a lot because Freddie has so many options for what to do about you know, all this stuff. Okay. Not everything. Lock it up. There's a space stone again. So he's going to get to move one more card. Gives him a lot of options because that dinosaur could be anywhere next turn. Holy smokes. I feel like Kibler has got this one nigh locked up. He doesn't have the Shang Chi. That's 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 humongous right now. He can't deal with the the Shuri's lab. He can't even do if. anything to get into. So Kibler can well, can move the Soul Stone. He, he's kind of Kibler's got so many options with this. So almost no matter how he does this, arrows coming down onto the board. So he has to win one of these two lanes. That's yeah. it. Yeah, I, there's no. You know, we can see both players' hands. We know there's nothing. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Freddie can't really retreat. He just plays nothing? Yeah, it makes sense. He, like, retreating is, is not a... The cube's already at max, so there's no value yeah. in retreating on this turn. <laughs> oh, right. Kibler gets... Scrapes one in there. The second win, the first full game win for Kibler. This match is going to continue on, and now it is mandatory snap time. Yep, that's it. No more... You know, basically, there's no more snapping, because... Oh, armor. Now, nah, that was worse for Kibler than it was for Freddy there. I definitely think so. So th this is another question I have for you: is, is how did how did how did y'all come up with the idea that like you know what after a certain point you're just going to have to play as though the game is snapped right away? Well, because otherwise the game could just go a really really long time, and we wanted the early snaps to really matter, right? Like a good a good re tactical retreat or a, you know a snap at the right time, really really important. But once you get low, especially if there's if if Kibler gets down to one here. You know, that's he has to win what eight in a row, seven games in a row to come back. It could be a really long time. So this this a default snap makes it so that the minimum damage going on is at least two, and you don't have like a okay, I got to win ten games in a row to come back. It's just forever. <laughs> it's, it's not fun. So this kind of this kind of speeds the end up a little bit while still maintaining the importance of those early snaps and victories. And again, Kibler's got the play lockjaw, three stones, and by the way, this Ooh. negative zone. That doesn't look like it's too helpful right now. And there was a reality stone in hand for Gibbler as well. You know, it's, uh, what's, who, for whom is Onslaught Citadel better? Does it matter at all for either player? If you look at the ongoing effects, I, I feel like most of them are defensive. For Kibler, I think it can matter with Devil Dinosaur. Oh, that's true. And Power it can Stone. Also, it can, yeah, it can, it can matter with that. And it can matter versus Red Skull on Freddy's side. Red right. Skull... I believe is an ongoing effect. Oh, oh where's the Titania going? I guess it's going to stay on, uh, it's going to stay on Freddy's side, no matter what. Yeah, I think Freddy was trying to lock up the lane there a little bit and then steal it back with Titania later on. But this lane is uh, kind of the opposite kind of uh, lockup that you're looking for here. Well, this is the reality stone. Oh, bye, Frost. Wow, everything moves. Does that matter at all? Doesn't look like it has a, an effect right now. It's just dramatic. Bad verbal. It's just dramatic. <laughs> That's how you want them all to be. <laughs> all right, well, I, I, feel like, turn. I feel like being like the second most dramatic person on the planet right now. That is exactly what I want. I don't know how you guys capture it every time. <laughs> Kibler's uh, kind of feeling it too. This is a little bit of a guessing game uh, here as well. Because if Kibler doesn't play Arrow and he doesn't play Armor, what that means is Shang-Chi is available from Freddy's side. But if he plays Arrow, that means that Shang-Chi is not available from Freddy's side this turn. Uh, but yeah, right. if he doesn't, pl if he plays Arrow here, he can't, he can draw armor because America Chavez has already been pulled from the deck by Lockjaw. So he does have a draw available next turn. Mm. And that's just, it's an effect that feels like it continues and it continues dino. and it continues. Yeah. Kibler says, if I play the dino here, now there's two big things you got to blow up with Shang-Chi and you can't do that. Yeah. He's winning the other two lanes, right? So just a Shang-Chi this turn to, you know, doing it middle represents a humongous amount of power lost for Kibler. Uh, wow. He's going to doubling up Red Skull. That's a lot of power. Is that enough? Oh, did he play zero also before this? That zero is, that zero is this turn, right? Ah, uh, you're right. It didn't, it didn't shut off the Titania. So this will, this will kill the ongoing effect that Red Skull has, which is the plus two power to all of your opposing side 
So uh, he's, gonna, he's going into last turn winning the middle location, losing to the two. It's going to give initiative to Kibler. But he's got, he's got the Shang-Chi available for turn six. Oh, he's changing it up. I will say, if Kibler is winning two of these lanes, which right now he's not. He is. Mel, the Red Skull. Uh, oh, he's, I see Kibler's what you're saying. winning left and right, yeah. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Did, did Kibler accidentally sink himself on this one? Well, he's got the, Kibler has the arrow, and he's and he's flipping first. How does so he win the center control, lane, though? He can control. He's losing center lane. Oh, yeah. but if uh, if his oh, opponent no. goes Shang Chi, that that's enough to defeat. It's enough to defeat him, right? An oh, arrow geez. beats a Shang Chi play. I'm here. very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but if he, his opponent goes something like Maximus Killmonger. Although Killmonger kills Katania at zero, you can't play Killmonger, right? If his opponent goes Spider Woman and he plays Arrow, he loses, right? It'd be two plus six is eight. And then so, you lose so, the tiebreaker, yeah. <laughs> Freddy, Freddy plays Shang-Chi against the wow. Arrow and he loses. Well, he's, also got, uh, he's also got Power Stone, right? So, okay. So that's... Uh... <laughs> That would be yeah, Freddy, power. Freddy's lost this one. Holy smokes, Kibler's done it well, again. Is that, hold on. That's uh, five, uh, uh, 13, 12 power minus four is eight. It's a tie. Yeah, he's got it. He's lost. Yeah, Freddy's lost. Kibler's wow. Done. Freddy's looking at it, trying to figure out anything. It, Freddy's just going to clasp the hands and say, no arrow, please. Yeah, right. And he yeah. sees it. <laughs> wow. Turn about his fair play there. Kibler's seen the same thing on the other side multiple times. <laughs> Oh, he's back in it. He's back in it. He's got to win three in a row. He can. He can still. No, the, the starting snap. He's got to win three in a row. That's it. Kibler that's, must that's win if, the next three. That is if Freddie's retreating. If Freddie stays in it like that one, this could be two games. Well, he, he has to. He, ha, he no. He has to stay in it. The cube's two. He's got five health. So uh, there's no benefit to retreating at this point at all because you don't save any cubes. So here's the, the thing. Starts at two and the cube starts. If, if Freddie retreats this game, he can retreat next game as well. And then it's still the same thing. Like he should be, I think that Freddie should be using retreats rather aggressively. No, it doesn't matter. Going to the end of the game, he's going to lose two cubes. Retreating, he loses two cubes. You might as well play it out, right? Because you have a chance to win. Oh, it's actually just two max. It doesn't have the, the final two four max. attached to it. That's because Kibble gotcha. only has two health. You can't deal more damage than, than you have health or, uh, except for the starting the starting devil. If you have one health, you could deal two damage if uh, you get into high stakes. Perhaps. See, this is, this is why I need friends. It's that I can try <laughs> these things out and learn them. All right, so Freddy's drawn, like, the tools he needs. He's got Arrow, he's got Shang-Chi, he's got Cosmo. I'm not sure that that's uh, uh, relevant, except it may be going against some of the stones on a, on a Lockjaw location. It definitely, I think, is a lot more beneficial when you have initiative so that you can you can predict some, some uh, yeah. on-reveal effects and take advantage of that. But Shuri's Lab, I think, could be a major benefit to Freddy Babes in this one. Like, when you have Lizard and you have Titania, you have very low-cost options they get a massive amount of power from them. It doesn't, they become Shang-Chi targets as soon as you start doing that. But you're right, that's a lot of power. You can also play him to Shuri's lab and then move him to New York on turn six, bring up more space on Shuri's lab. Yeah, oh, I hate New York. <laughs> what, just New like York, in general? Or? It, it, well, <laughs> yes, I hate it in the game and I hate it <laughs> in real life as well. What do you, why do you hate New York? Just like the, the game of chicken that happens? Like, uh, are you going to New York? Or? Okay, so are you are you asking me like in the game or in real life? In the game, in the game. Okay, so yeah, I, I, the reason I don't like it in, in the game is because I think way too much about everything. And so what happens is I always lose because of New York. <laughs> you do one too many like trips around the, if they do this, I'm going to do this, but if they do this, then I'm going to do this, then they do that. You, 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 yeah, you it's, an endless, a, uh... it's an endless cycle. Oh, he's going, he's going to Shuri's lab again. Players tend to not awesome. play on New York. And honestly, this is one of the things I've just come to terms with at this point, which is like, I'm just going to put things in, in New York. No, it just reduces your options, right? Because you could yeah, I'm okay with play that. somewhere else and then go to New York later, right? Yeah. Or you can do things like just change New York, which is something I wish they would do in the game and in real life. Well, he's doing it right now with Reality Stone. He's saying, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take away those options. Those, those, those cards are stuck at Shuri's lab if See, I change this New York. This is why we need Thanos in real life to change New York and New York alone. <laughs> All right, there's the Cosmo. Yeah, Freddie is pretty big in Shuri's lab. 
if, if Freddy had played. Oh, oh, oh no! Oh, oh, oh no! no! Oh, oh, that's not what he wanted to see. And those soul stones don't help him very much. He draws some extra cards, I guess. That okay, is let's, rough. Let's try to find some benefits here. Is there any reason why this being on bar sinister is good right now? It is minus three power per unit your opponent has, but you only have four power here. Okay, yeah, I'm reaching a little too far. Well, it's minus what? What? It's minus nine power to each enemy card. Is that is soul minus stone ongoing or on reveal? <laughs> soul stone, I believe, is ongoing. Okay, all right. I, well, I want to we'll say that if it's an effect, it's ongoing. I thought it if was, it's an I incident, it I believe it's on reveal. So again, we're going to use the internet because it tells us everything. Soulstone is on reveal, so uh, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so it's it's really bad. <laughs> yeah, no, this is terrible. <laughs> Yeah, and Kibler has to reveal his turn five play here to his opponent, thanks to, thanks to Daredevil. And they're, they're all in here. They have to play it out, no matter what happens here. All right, he's played armor on turn five. Soaking some... Sunspot's getting bigger. Enough bigger to get into Shang-Chi range. Interesting. Uh, so I'm... I feel like I'm a little bit concerned for Killer's play here. So Kibler had initiative on this turn. He could have protected the She-Hulk on this one and then used Arrow on the final turn to try and blow the opponent out with Fisk Tower. Anything that gets moved there is going to be destroyed. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So Arrow I think into Fisk Tower is something. Really what I think this turn is is that Kibler has to just pick a line and go with it. And there's a lot of different 50-50s in this one. So which one are you going to guess that your opponent has? I think that's what this final this game has turned into, and it looks like this is going to be the final one. Oh, he's you know he might be protecting himself from the arrow move here by uh, filling Fisk Tower. How do you get rid of this stuff in the on the left? Well, you know it's interesting. He's going into turn the nice. final turn, winning winning two out of three. But it's very easy for his opponent to take Bar Sinister. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait a minute. So, Shang-Chi is locked out of the right lane because of Cosmo. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and Sunspot represents a real threat. Despite having filled that lane, he can go up, you know, plus six there, right? Yeah, I think that Killer's just out of this one. Freddy's got so many options. Well, Bar Sinister. Spider Woman represents a lot of bonus power. He's gonna he's gonna win both of those two. Is there any yeah. anything he can do? He's got he's got oh arrow's locked out of Shuri's lab. Arrow would have been really big here once again, except for Cosmo. Yeah, he knows it. He knows it's over. Wow. It's a tough game. I think the Bar oh. Sinister has gotten Kibler in this one. Freddy yep. Babes shows once again my control options can be very powerful. Wow. Oh, it is. <laughs> Wait, it is ongoing. <laughs> the internet lied to me. <laughs> it says like, I used to read the word on review on this. Story. <laughs> Victory. <laughs> oh, you got it anyway. You got it anyway. <laughs> oh, caster's law. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, seriously. I mean, that's that's dig it up like, you know. 10 year old memes at this point, but you're not wrong about it. I'm just saying, I, I'm screenshotting it right now and I'm putting a timestamp on it. I'm doing it across the things so that everyone can see what I'm doing. The site says on reveal. I'm just, I'm saying it right there, right now. Well, it also has an on reveal. It's just, if you keep reading, there's an ongoing in there eventually. Yeah. I just, you know, you, you got to read the whole paragraph sometimes. <laughs> Either way, that that is like, that is a pretty tight matchup, I think, all things considered. But Freddy Babes took such a big early lead there from two snapped yeah. games being completed. Yep, that was that got the mat those early games. Uh, and you know, Gibbler tried to retreat that first game. He just missed it. He took too long trying to decide what he wanted to do, and that was it. The age micro making a slight difference <laughs> in that one. Kibler's not out of the tournament just yet. Kibler's going to drop down to the loser's bracket now, which means he's going to have to swap to the second deck. That's what all the competitors had to do. They had to submit two decks to this one. And now, and that's on the loser's bracket, he's swapping over to the second one. So he's not out of the tournament just yet. We got more Marvel Snap games that are coming up right now. This is a lot of matches that we have going on. So stay tuned. We got a bit more coming.
Welcome back, everybody. It is the Infinity Gauntlet, the Marvel Snap Invitational. We are in the bottom bracket, but we have got some top quality matches for you. I am uh, Chris, a.k.a. Christo Ciccone. I am joined by uh, somebody who I have, uh, I was supposed to cast some cards with, uh, what feels like ages ago, and we finally <laughs> have the opportunity to be sitting side by side. Nathan, admirable, how are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing fantastic. It has been a while for this. You know, I like to jump around to card games if I if I can. It's always something I'm going to enjoy with it. Uh, and I have to say, it's it has been, uh, I think, too long since we've been able to sit down and cast some cards together. You know, I feel like every single time there's a new game or there's a new Discord, uh, you and I are somewhere in there and we're trying to play the game and hang out with everybody. So to, to finally be here sitting down and casting, what better game is it for than Marvel Snap? feels like every single game we got people coming in absolutely and, and that's that's the beautiful part of this game we're about to do right Specy versus amaz these are you know somebody with specimen that i've i've cast with i've hung out with before uh you you know amaz fairly well so i feel like we got a good uh got a good good vibe here going for this matchup yeah i I, th I think so as well you know again this is a lot of card history throughout the tournament so far and it's always fun to see these one now for the losers bracket this is great because it means someone's going home so the stakes are even higher as we get into this one it's not just the snapping anymore it is the fact that if you lose you are now out of it and so looking at the deck list that we have I want to look at Amaz's first because this is an interesting one. I always like Galactus decks. They feel like that they always have something crazy that can happen, something crazy that can go on for this. This one does seem a little bit more straightforward at the end of the day, but with Wave in here, I feel like you get a lot of turbo effects available. Psylocke, Electro, and Wave to be able to accelerate things out. And that's that's kind of the danger with Wave, right? Because Wave drops and you don't necessarily have access to something that can shut Galactus off. So all of a sudden, Wave into Galactus, it's, it's happening, you have no control over it and all of a sudden you know uh, Amaz has death has Chavez has null to go in and, and back that up yeah and so when we look over at specimens side of things it is going to be the Thanos power that we all expect to see I th the one thing that I'm curious about in this deck is because Lockjaw being such a big centerpiece of how this deck can interact how much can Kang really mess up your turns when you play a Lockjaw and then suddenly you fetch a Kang off of your stone's getting shuffled back in. This is something I feel like I have really yet to see happen with this. But other than that, it's just pretty much the straightforward power level that you get from this deck. Lots of stuff in here. You're trading off that bit of consistency for power. And Leash, of course, being possibly the strongest target that you can pull on, on turn four with a uh, with, with a Lockdown play. It, it just has all the tools, right? It has the ability to pull power out of nowhere. Galactus still needs a bit of setup. When it works, though, it's pretty much unstoppable. However, you've got to be able to find that lane. All kinds of things can can kind of mess you up where you, you got squirrels popping up here and there and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, you're, you're just, Galactus is sad, defeated by no, a squirrel. You're fine. You got a Killmonger to, to try and handle that. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's always something related to New York that messes everything up. <laughs> Shocker, right? <laughs> um, all right, we've covered the decks. I, th I think we're ready to go here. Uh, Specimen versus Amaz in, in our bottom bracket here. Loser goes home. Winner moves on to, to fight another day and try and get back into this thing. You know, Specimen, what a character. <laughs> I mean, the hood, he's just, you know, he's 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 in for it. He's ready to go here. I, I, the, the question I have is the, the headphones outside of the hoodie. Are you a headphone outside of the hoodie gamer or are you a headphone inside of the hoodie gamer? I, I don't know that I've ever gamed with the hood up. I, I feel like the headphones got to oh. go in the ears. I don't know. Oh, you could be missing something there then. I, I feel like that's been a very important feature for, for my warmth, given how, how cold and rainy it has been in California uh, for the last few weeks or so. I mean, being being Canadian, I feel like it's just one of those things where I'm I'm just never cold. I was born into it. <laughs> <laughs> Always an important feature to to remember. Canadians Absolutely. are never cold. Absolutely. Um, Specy getting that has, has Specy already snapped. I do believe. Yeah. In speaking of the weather and the hoodies, Specy is snapped. He's got Quinjet. He's got Lockjaw. He's got a couple stones in hand. He's got to be feeling pretty good. Mindstone, I feel like, is really one of the things that can put you into an automatic snap process because it, it drawing two stones out of your deck means that you are now, you're now negating that consistency trade-off that you have. You're drawing two things. They're very powerful. You get them out of the deck. Altar of Death, I will say, though, is a major swing to what's happening here. You saw Specimen's reaction to Altar of Death. For Amaz now snapping back with Electro off Altar of Death, this is many options that Amaz is going to have here. 
And this is open deckless, right? So Spessy knows that uh, that Galactus is an option with Electra coming down here uh, with the extra energy. That's going to give him the option to drop Galactus next turn. You do have Reality Stone, which could maybe change things, but Amaz having priority means that he is going to get Altar of Death and he is going to get the Electro taken out before anything big happens there. But I'm looking for Specimen maybe to, to have a change at some point available that maybe that can change something here. So Electro, two extra energy for Amaz. He's going into, what is that, four, six energy next turn? Uh, is that, that's seven energy, I believe? Altar of Death gives you two, gonna be on four. Oh, yes, seven gives energy. You one. Goodness gracious. That's gonna be kind of hard to beat. The Space Stone, I will feel like, is, is gonna be a big part of this too, though, because now you can shift over. Really what this boils down to, I think, from Specimen's side is, does Galactus show up or not? If, if you're a Mazda, though, what, what else would you be doing here? Wouldn't getting Galactus down just be the game plan? Uh, it can be. I'm thinking that, you know, Dr. Octopus try and empty your opponent's hand. Mm -hmm. That always feels like that's the intro to how this deck wants to work, is if you can Dr. Octopus, you can shut off so many tools your opponent has to be able to change things here. That is a valid point. And Amaz missing some of those big hitters that you'd be looking for to follow up after Galactus, right? You don't have the uh, the Chavez in hand. You don't have the Death in hand. So um, going to have a little bit more of a limited follow-up, though I have seen folks drop Galactus and come back with Dr. Octopus and try and fill up, <laughs> you know, fill up the board, and you have a great read into what your opponent's doing. Yeah, plus your opponent already has Lockjaw and Space Stone in the lane that you're playing Galactus in. So you see here that Specimen is moving the Lockjaw, playing Leech, hoping to hit Null. Something like this, some big follow-up play that is available from this. So this does shut off a lot of options on a Mazda side, but I'm curious how big of a difference this is really going to be at the end of the day, because right now your lanes are getting really messed up. And there you see Thanos pop out on the Altar of Death, so everything's going off that side, and uh, having the two stones face off against Galactus is <laughs> not exactly ideal. The Leech didn't hit anything, I mean, overly important either. Probably looking, yeah, to hit the Death so they... Death can't be discounted, hit null, oh so you don't get the extra boost. Oh my gosh, that is a huge draw with the null. And Amaz saw... Wait, did Amaz see the Shang-Chi come out? Yes. Off of the Lockjaw, get pulled. Yeah. So knows there's no answer to it. Yeah, the, the whole idea of this too is because Galactus's power is so low, your opponent's always going to have initiative in spots like this. So Correct. you can wait till the final spot and then you can drop null. You saw that Leech got played. You don't have a fear of a follow-up for the leech being there. Like, this is just get some stuff in play. Don't waste too many of your resources. And then drop the null for the win. Null was at 29, 29 power? Correct. 29 power, Chris. How do you beat a six energy card that's 29 power? You do not. But <laughs> he doesn't seem upset. He doesn't seem upset. He's, uh, he's, he's feeling loose. Does he know something we don't? I think that what it's at right now is that you are sitting with four cubes as a risk right now. You will have the option to retreat if you want on the final turn. So why not play it out and see what ends up happening here? I mean, if you're if you're Spessy here, are you, oh. are you really considering what, 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 what would, even happened? So, oh, Specimen. Specimen is, he's leveling up right now. Like he's going, he, he's just going like full mode on this one. And he does have, this is it. Hang happens, yes. null happens. So now he knows. Like, this is an auto retreat. You'd have to imagine. And, uh, There's no way Specimen sticks around. Th this is like the power that Kang gives you, though, is it gives you that option to know when you're defeated and to retreat afterwards. It's giving you knowledge that sometimes you can manipulate turns. Sometimes it's giving you knowledge so that you can manipulate how to retreat. Correct. You don't have much of a choice when you're manipulating turns when you have one location and one slot to play a card in. You, so. you, okay. You know what? A retreat later. Oh, come on. <laughs> Classic Spessy move. <laughs> yeah, easy win for Amaz on that one. The Null being, uh, of course, a massive draw on that one. I think the locations worked out well for Amaz. Uh, there was very little arrow counterplay. Pretty much, uh, Spessy would have had to guess on that turn that Galactus was going to come down. So if you use the arrow and Galactus comes down, big win. If you use the arrow and Galactus doesn't, What's really the difference in that one? You're hoping that maybe your opponent doesn't play Galactus, you leech a bunch of key cards, and you can pick up the win that way. I think the gamble with leech was a little bit better, quite literally because you can hit null with it. If you hit null, the Galactus is nothing. 
Exactly. If you hit null, and again, even if you hit something like death while not as strong a finisher, well, the discount goes away. So you don't have a choice in the matter. You can't play it. And this is uh, this is a set of locations. Yeah, this is this is something. I think that for specimen, this is like something that can be really detrimental. It's you can't play on death domain very easily. You can't play on dark dimension with your lockjaw. Uh, you're hoping that this third location does not mess everything up. The lockjaw is gone. That cannot oh, feel Oh, why good. Sokovia? <laughs> I mean, Sokovia, might, the game text might as well read. Just, you know, destroy your game plan, your hope, <laughs> your dreams, all of it. Take it all away. Ruin one player's hopes and dreams. Electro coming back out. Going to be destroyed. That's what you want. You don't want Electro sticking around. Yeah. Into that death a bit as well. Get out of here, Electro. We need you for one job and one job only. Just like me. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, looking at it, Wave, you know, I, I, I was wondering, do you ever drop Wave on Death's Domain as well? You dropped your Galactus on Sokovia, you got a Killmonger after the fact to clean up what Specy has there. Yeah, the, it really doesn't matter too much where the Wave comes down, other than for the factor of, like, maybe prohibiting some of your opponent's plays. But Amaz is going to have access to Galactus next turn regardless. Like, you're, you're going to have six energy on turn five. That's one of the key pieces for the deck. And right. then how the follow-up is going to work makes it makes a difference. So Galactus, I think this is pretty easy play at this point. You Again, like you said, you have a Killmonger to handle three of these stones. Hopefully you can draw something better than that, though, because the wave's not getting revealed ever. I, I feel like for Amaz, this is a spot where you don't necessarily want to snap because your hand's just not super good. Specimen going to go for the snap instead. And this is a big advantage, I think, for Specimen because he's going to be able to see what's going on here. If he now knows that Galactus is coming down, Maybe he can trade that off and find himself in a spot where Reality Stone can win the game. So Kang is going to come down. You see Galactus get revealed. And so now, if you arrow on the left side, Galactus stays there. So this is, a, this is a little bit of mind game stuff that gets opened up now. Plus that snap also gets reset when Kang gets when Kang resets the turn. So you're going for a little bit of a double bluff there. Hey, bluff this, check out what's going on. I get to decide what I want to do. And knowing that arrows in hand, that absolutely changes the game here. Um, actually, how, how is that going to work? Arrow on uh, so domain is going to kill arrow and... Yes, it, it would kill those. The difference is your opponent's going to have initiative sometimes in those spots. Yes. Um, and so you notice the snap gets reversed here by Kang as well. Because Kang resets the turn to the very start. Yeah. The snap was technically not there at the start of the turn. So Specimen now has that same plan. So how on earth do you manipulate this to work to your advantage? If you Reality Stone and Death's Domain on the left, you can take away the Death's Domain activation. The thing about it's happening is you're moving where the Galactus is going. And if it's on Death's Domain alone, you're now facing down two power that you have to beat. So maybe you can bluff your opponent in some way here. So like you move the Galactus, for instance, does Amaz actually want to play something here? Well, the answer the answer is like no, because Death's Domain can play. So now the follow-up for Specimen is Reality Stone, change the location, yes. get your stuff down. This is kind of a wonky play, but honestly, this feels really clever to me. It absolutely is because Amaz is thinking to himself, if I drop anything here, it just dies. Yeah, I don't think there's a card in the deck that actually changes this. I, I... Look at the confusion on Amaz's face right now, thinking, what, what, why would he do this? And Spessy knows anything he drops there is going to survive. And without initiative, wow. He's good. He's good. This is a here. brilliant play from Specimen. He's sweating, though. I think that's just, I think that's just Specimen. I could, that's, I mean, that's, every just... single time I see a reaction from Spessy, it just looks like this. Now, and then the question is, is is the Doc Ock science, can that change anything? Because I know that the way that this card operates, it feels like sometimes it says play the card. Sometimes it feels like it says put it in play. I don't know every single I, interaction that Dr. Octopus has with pulling cards onto the field. That's a, a wow. great point. And we're not going to find out because it looks like Amaz he's, is going to uh, say toodaloo. He's considering it. And I don't blame him here. Like. If Amaz, if if Reality Stone comes up in Amaz's mind, I think that causes the retreat. Yeah. If you end up forgetting that Reality Stone changes this location and then opens up your next play, doesn't feel the same way. So Amaz passes the turn, and then he sees Reality Stone, and he goes, ah, yeah, I, that's the one I should have thought about.
And you know what the crazy part is? That was the only option Spessy had because the other two cards that it had both cost six. So he has wow. Thanos and Chavez who uh, who come down for six and they can't be played with the Reality Stone. The Reality Stone in and of itself doesn't win you the location. <laughs> That is just that is just some absolutely brilliant play. This this is a great snap match, Chris. I, I just can't think of anything wilder I've seen other than for Galactus by itself to lose to three power uh, with a follow up turn to the Galactus being played. The, I, I mean, it, that, that's the beauty of snap, right? Is you, you end up in these wonky situations that you really have to think through because so much can happen. You're thinking, hey, nobody can play anything here. It's game over, but it's not. Though, Spessy has a deck full of stones, he has to draw the right card. Right, Bye, Frost comes down. Can be a big difference. That, that Dream Dimension as well, in turn five, cards costing one more, can mess with Amaz's Galactus a little bit as well. Um, you know, trying to drop it on five after playing something like Electro or something like Psylocke. So that can also make... Uh... That's not true. The six can't cost seven. So okay. Spessy, I think, shaking their head a little bit at the distribution here, where Bifrost is going to shift everything to the right by one. Uh, Spessy never has to worry about arrow from Maz's side of things. So if you drop Lockjaw in the center here, and then you try to fill this up, what happens is when it shifts to the right, you don't necessarily have as many things in play. So a little minor thing. I think it's unlikely to make a difference because we're seeing Killmonger play this turn. But it's, it's when those oh. little things matter, they matter a lot! Oh, like that. That matters a lot! That is correct. I think if you're in Spessy's side and you see a leech get pulled this early off of a lockjaw, yeah. that you are snapping. A hundred percent. And I and Spessy's a pretty aggressive snapper typically as well. So it's strange to... Uh, there, there it comes. Yeah. And I think Amaz knows the drill here. This is, this is a, possibly the worst outcome that can happen uh, against this deck. Yeah, easy retreat. It's only one cube. Not, not, not a super big deal yet. But three of his Still four five finishers. To work with. Yeah, three of his four finishers in hand, all of which getting <laughs> um, essentially silenced does not feel very good. So we've got Spessy uh, counting his life total here. He's got six left. Amaz has five. Yeah, six to five is can be a, a massive difference at times as well. You know, for Amaz, he can let one more match rip, and then it's one max damage at that point. Not on max stakes yet. But we're getting there. So that, that's got a, you know, when Amaz draws his hand and sees Electro and it sees Wave in it, gotta, gotta feel like that's a pretty good start to things. Spessy, the Mind Stone makes all the difference, right? That cleans your hand up so much, gets you the cards you want. Now you're just looking for Lockjaw. Yeah, so Spessy, I think, is changing up the snap plan a little bit. I think in a blind matchup, if you have Mind Stone, it, I think it's a pretty easy, justifiable snap. You're against Killmonger and you're against a deck that does not care too much about anything other than landing a Galactus in play. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the counterplay to that, I feel like the, the, the snap value goes down by a considerable amount. Uh, so I think given that, Spessy has a little bit of options here to maybe not snap and take their time. Maybe you're trying to bait uh, Amaz into actually losing two cubes so that way there's not few, four cubes at stake from your side. So that's you have to win two games versus three at that point. There's a lot of little things like that that can change some of the equations and how they're going to function here. So for Spessy not snapping despite having Mindstone, uh, I, I think it's okay. I think he's got some plans in mind and... and you know, as we saw in a, in a game just a couple of rounds ago, you know, that was some brilliant stuff we cooked up. And so I'm hoping he can do it again. Absolutely. And, and that's, again, that's the beauty of having these stones is not necessarily for their power value, but just the flexibility that it gives you um, to be able to play around certain scenarios, moving things around with the space stone, using the reality stone to change the location. Um, but he's he's got to decide, you know, where he wants to commit, knowing that Amaz, like you said, Nathan, is just waiting for that Galactus to come down because that's the only location that matters. However, that's not in Amaz's hand right now, and not not much else is really. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of tough to to figure it out from Spessy's side right now. This is not a beautiful looking hand that you have. You know, just drop some raw power and play. Why not? And that's that's always the risk, right? You're going to drop She Hulk. You have to worry about Shang-Chi coming down, which is in Amaz's hand. You have to think about Galactus coming down to a different location, which we know uh, is not currently in Amaz's Ooh. hand. There are options, but there's the snap because Shang-Chi's going to take She-Hulk out. Or will cool. it? Yeah, spessy has got a little thing, couple things to figure out here. When you see the snap, that definitely brings something like Galactus to your mind. And if Spessy tries to go for a counterplay, 
and ends up using Arrow, not much gets accomplished with that. I mean, Arrow moving Shang-Chi away will still be beneficial, and that is the logical play to move it to, let's say, Machine World to block what could be a Galactus coming down. Well, you give your opponent an Actually, arrow in that spot, not too much of a difference. The Shang-Chi, though, with Specy having initiative means that the Shang-Chi is going to destroy the arrow. So center location is effectively lost now for Specy in this spot, but it is a big advantage to the left. Amaz only has access to one card, so you need to put enough power in play to fight in two different spots. Correct. And now you've got Null. That's a, that's still a, a big null you have. It's 19 and... because of Killmonger and because of Shang-Chi, so. So do you go, do you now go just lock jaw, drop some, <laughs> drop some stones and hope maybe you pull out something, something big that's hanging out in your deck, but Thanos is in hand, Chavez is in hand, She-Hulk is dead, Arrow's been played, Devil Dinosaur would be worth a, a couple points here? Oh, I, I'm just not certain. I think this might be a retreat spot. Yeah, yeah Specy's gonna retreat. Victory. It's a tough round. It's it's I think it's not un it's not rare that the deck uh on Amaz's side can win with just Killmonger and Shang-Chi and putting a bunch of power on the null. But it is a fairly uncommon outcome. This is not necessarily the way you want to play, and I feel like Vault super mixed things up here. Being able to land Shang-Chi on a buffed arrow is a pretty rare circumstance. Mindscape. Oh boy. Oh my. This can completely mess up the game plans from both sides of things. This turns into like almost a game of chicken at times. And you have to wonder, so Specy obviously <laughs> has the ability to flip that around, but with with Reality Stone, assuming again, he uh, he can dig it out, is, is it more beneficial for him to maybe leave that knowing that if Amaz does get a Galactus out, that he may be passing along a death or a null? It's, I think it certainly can be beneficial to, to either side of this. For Specy seeing a, a Lockjaw get drawn right after you play both your stones, not the most fun thing in the game that you could see. A lot of times you don't need to super high value from Lockjaw, just a couple points of it can make a difference. But the Mindscape, uh, you know, the dimension that this opens up into different styles of play, I think is gonna boil down to a guessing game for Specy at the end of the day. It's if your opponent has a mana ramp, that question all is going to be, is this Galactus or is this not? And we do see Kang in hand for, for Specimen. So that is an option to get a little bit of a preview into, you know, maybe Galactus coming down or, or something like that. So can maybe decide, hey, this looks better or worse for me and then can adjust accordingly. Again, if the Reality Stone comes up. Um, but then we see the Lockjaw come down and Killmonger clean up what's on the board, including Amaz's own uh, Sunspot there. Next mansion, how much is this going to change things? This card always terrifies me. That armor. Oh, oh my. my. That is that that is immediate Ooh. snap. Putting a Thanos behind an armor. I don't know if you could find a more one-sided double drop than that out of X Mansion. Yeah, that is that is a lot. But Amaz does have access to Psylocke into Galactus and then Null. But the Mindscape is really changing that. If you if you decide to go Psylocke into Galactus, the hands shift off Mindscape. You're giving away no yeah. and death. And the, the fact that the third location was X Mansion meant that you could never actually Galactus that location. You can't Galactus the center location of Dark Dimension because you can't reveal the cards. So Mindscape has to be the place. And that's the last place you want this to happen. <laughs> and Amaz agrees. I'm yep, I'm, I think that's a good spot to go ahead and give that one up. It, this is like, I think, something that Galactus can often struggle with is the location variance. If you get some bad ones, it is really bad. For Thanos' uh, side, if you get some bad locations, it's like, eh, I have some ways to play around this. Galactus is very reliant on the synergy that those two power plays are going to provide, the Galactus plus the Null. If those get messed up, the whole plan is messed up. Bessie loving the leech in his hand. Which is confusing to me because I feel like you don't want Leech in your hand. I feel like you want Leech in the deck and you want to lockjaw that sucker out at three or four. I don't. I don't mind having the Leech. You know, again, if you turn five the Leech Whoa, and you pull up uh, any key card, <laughs> or, you know, or Project Pegasus, that's fine too. Let's go ahead and get it all done right now. Oh my! But the draw, the option for a turn to Galactus is not something I have considered very much. So 
specimen not going with the leech? Yeah, he wants to wait on the leech, it looks like, so that way he can try to hit a critical card. So the little bit more time you give for Amaz to get cards in hand, the, the higher chance you're going to be able to hit a Null or to hit a Galactus. But but if you're a monster, do you just you just do it? You <laughs> do it on the unrevealed location. Wow. <laughs> wow, and the snap. <laughs> and the snap. What is going to come out of that final location? Especially says, you know unknown. what? Let's go. Oh boy. I don't think I've seen a turn two Galactus, Chris. I'm sorry, I'm still, that's... That's irrelevant. Yeah, the most harmless location you can pull, but, you know, Arrow building up some points there. Um, death is playable on six. Null probably didn't get a whole lot of a buff either, so not the best case scenario for Amaz here. Shang-Chi in both hands, though, going to be able to answer if any big boys come down before that last turn. That, that is a lot of a priority difference here, too. You know, typically the Galactus deck does not want to have priority so that way you can land your stuff. That's one of the reasons why Dr. Octopus, I think, is super powerful in this deck as well, is you get to pull all of the cards from your opponent's hand, fill up the location, and then be able to make your choice. And that's that's not a, even a bad call here. Going Psylocke into to Doc Ock, you fill up the location, and then you decide, hey, how can, can I beat this? Is it a death? Is it a Shang-Chi? What would help me, allow me to defeat this? So we'll we'll see if that's the direction Amaz goes here. On four, getting five power. Going straight for the Doc Ock. This, this is definitely the line, I think. You're going to have a considerable amount of power in play. If your opponent has only big threats, this will change everything. But what if a leech comes down from the Doc? What if, I mean, there, there's a distinct possibility there. <laughs> and Spessy willing it. Oh my gosh. But you know, I, I am terrified for both players right now. <laughs> Amos is playing for the match. Specimen, if he loses this, still got a couple more games. And talk about playing for the match. Dropping Galactus on uh, turn two without even <laughs> knowing the location. Okay, here we go. Leech, leech. does not come down. Shang-Chi does not come down. Oh, I'm sorry, Leech oh, did leech come down. Does come down. Leech does Shang-Chi come does down? not come down. But that that's the one you're looking for if you're in Spessy's spot, is you want the Leech to hit. And that resets death. That's not going to do it. The oh, only you can see that Spessy's stressed about it, though. Like, is 25 enough? You're going to go to 27 from Devil Dino? You're hoping that you that you messed up Shang-Chi. You're hoping that you messed up Null. Amaz gets one more draw here to draw Null because that, that is the only card. That's the only card that can do it. I mean, you mentioned it early, though, that the... There wasn't a ton blown up by Galactus, so, you know, how much does the Null provide? Oh, oh that's right, there's Shavas in the deck. I, we, I just completely forgot about that. This is just prey. This, it's, it's, and that's it. GG, it's over. It's done. Spessy moves on. Wow. You saw the reaction from Spessy. They're like, no, he did not draw the Oh. Yes, he was. He was Leech. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate Amaz saying like, hey, you know what? Leech got me. Leech got me. That's what did it. Uh, heck of a heck of a series, though. I mean, to your point, you know, Amaz was playing for it. Was playing for the series, and Spessy would have had one one little life left had that gone a different direction. So, heck of a round here. Uh, unfortunately, Amaz out of the event. Uh, Spessy will be moving on. Yeah, this is, this boasts the power that Leech can hold, especially when you have massive early plays and massive late game plays as well. If you can manage to mess up your opponent's draw, that's gonna be the end of it. That's the power that Leech holds, and I think if your deck is not capable of doing both those factors, early game plus late game, Leech is a really tough card to use. We've got more coverage from the Infinity Gauntlet, Marie Bartholdi and Nathan. That's Admiral Zamora here as we continue our snap here in round two of the Losers Bracket. And we've got a heck of a one for you here with Blevins versus Hibbler. Shuri versus Deadpool, Nathan. Yeah, we've seen Deadpool uh, pop up in a couple spots so far. It has not boasted the power with which uh, 
it's intended to have, but on the first one we saw, it ran into Galactus as well. It's probably one of the worst yeah. things you can play. Now, fortunately for Kibler, we're in the loser's bracket here, so Blevins' is a Galactus deck has been taken out of the picture in this one. They're in the second deck at this point, and they get to see what's opening here. We can take a look at Blevins' deck. It's nothing too crazy that's going on. This is a Shuri deck with a little bit of flair in here and a little bit of flavor. He's uh, got Polaris in the deck, uh, Arnim Zola at the top end. I think this is more of kind of the old school style of Shuri that we, we initially saw, where yeah. sometimes Arnim Zola can really mix things up. Sometimes Polaris can give you some some pretty free wins, uh, given a couple locations, but nothing too crazy on this one. On Kibler's side, though, it is the Death Pool deck, and this I, I just love to see this every single time I see it, Maria. Yeah, it's great, right? I mean, nothing beats just putting your own creatures out there and just hitting them with a hammer. Uh, and Deadpool, we're going to see how many hammers we can hit that poor guy with. Don't worry, he likes it. Uh, and we've also got <laughs> Death at the top end. And check this out, Arnim Zola as well in this list. So, so we can have some crazy games on our hands here in this matchup, Nathan. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping that we can see both of them like avoid like a supernova or something and just get like more energy pouring in. So that way we can have like crazy uh, Deadpool, Arnim Zola things coming in at the end like there's just nothing better than that i see from these two decks because there's just a crazy amount of power they can generate with just a simple amount of extra energy just feels overwhelming at times all right let's head on down to the match kibler on the top of your screen the blevins on the bottom here we go, everybody. Loser's bracket means loser goes home. Winner stays alive. Tinker's workshop is going to start Ooh. to fulfill your dreams here, Nathan. <laughs> well, Levin's going to pour over the details here and say, what can I do? Not really much difference between waiting and going, so he's going to hang on for a bit. It's open deck list at this point, so you know what's going on with the matchups. So maybe that provides some incentive for Levin's holding on. You know, you see a Killmonger in your opponent's deck, and you go, well, wait a second. Do I want to just plow these ones down? Right away, or do I want to hang on for a bit? Absolutely, and Killmonger in Kibler's hand as well. Turn one, uh, Nova played out for Kibler there into the Tinkerer's Workshop. Gamma Lab showing up here on turn number two is going to change things around here. Hood is going to get Ooh. turned into a Hulk as well as Zero and Titanium. Yeah, Kibler does not have a way to grab priority with the opening hand that he had, so uh, it's not going to matter too much. It's, the Killmonger still is a pretty much one of the most fantastic plays you're going to be able to have in a situation like this. Yep, oh, yeah, and there's a snap yeah. right away from Blevins. Blevins. Oh, the oh, Cosmo. Right. Oh, so this is yeah. like a pretty big this gambit here. This is great. Blevins with Pryo here at the Gamma Lab. Wow. Cosmo just getting the job done. <laughs> yeah, you see Kibler's reaction. <laughs> you guys got there a little bit, Kibler. <laughs> Three hulks now for Blevins. Feeling comfortable in the Gamma Lab at 36 power as we head into turn number four. Yeah, Shuri available, but nothing big so far from Blevins. It's got a couple of big draws that can really make the difference, but right now, uh, I still think that you're kind of you're kind of piecing things together as Blevins goes along for Kibler. You're trying to scrape this one together, but it's looking like it's going to be tough. So Deathlock there is going to send Deadpool back to Kibler. Oh Ooh, my right. gosh! <laughs> Just sick rips. Sick that rips. is. That is a huge draw from Blevins' side. There's just, there's nothing you could pick, like, in the game that feels stronger right now. Absolutely not. Shuri Red Skull. GG. Kibler's going to kind of dump his hand, though, here on turn number five. Blevins putting Red Skull into Baxter building, trying to secure that, get the plus three power at the other locations. 32 power in the Baxter building. Just 17 for Kibler. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to see how Kibler walks away with this one. I'm seeing Armazola like onto yeah. a Hulk. That's not even enough. Kibler to retreat. Yeah, let's make Ooh. it two cubes instead of four. <laughs> yeah, Kibler is out of there. Blevins takes down round number one here in this. All right, so now we're seeing Shuri kind of boast the power that Shuri really has. You know, we, we've seen the the no Shuri, no problem matchups, but you know, with Shuri, big problem. But the, the problem is on the other side. Absolutely. Limbo revealing here in the middle is going to give us a turn seven this game. It's like a completely different card game now. This one's lasting at least seven turns. Yeah, I mean, it does flip the script on these players. Your deck has a plan, and the plan is... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here we go yet again. Tinker's Workshop going to give you four mana here on turn three. Excuse I just me, feel energy. scripted. <laughs> Scripted, scripted, pre-recorded, scripted. Here's Shuri, snap. 
from Kibler. Ooh, so Kibler with the early snap here. Evan's oh, gonna wow. retreat Look at this. now. Look at this. Yeah, didn't feel strong enough about that hand, even though he had literally all of the tools just sitting there for him. That's a Tillin for you, though. It's uh, Tillin's shuffling the hand back in and giving you three random yeah, cards absolutely. from the deck at that point. Absolutely. Those are a lot of locations messing with game plans there for those players. Nowhere so now, here in round three. So much of this game is going to boil down to whether or not Blevins can, can line up this armor, I feel like. Kibler's hand is not super strong. A couple of good plays available. But if Blevins lines up this armor... Oh, it's so much easier now. Okay, I take back everything I said. This is one of the easiest games of Blevins' life right now, it feels like. This is what's so great about Snap um, here. <laughs> speaking of <laughs> Blevins' snaps. The facial the reactions the of I'm the good. players from the snaps just feels impeccable right now. <laughs> just kiss. You want to you wanna kill things? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Kipper oh, sees it now. Oh, just... And nowhere was Hardy bad enough, honestly. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and fight. Every oh, 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 even. Uh, well, okay, yeah, Warrior Fall. Grace? I don't think it's enough, but he's got one location he can try and kill stuff in. Interesting. This is a weird game. And that's what, I mean, like, to finish my thought, that's what I love about Snap, right? These locations come out, and what you thought and what you were planning for two seconds earlier is completely obliterated. It's so it's so hard to take all of these into account, too. Like, I, I, I hear people talk about optimal play, and I feel like that word is used way too much in card games in general, because it's virtually impossible, I think, to play perfect games at times without the situation being super solved. But this is, this one's kind of mixing up a bit here. Polaris yeah. also feels like it mixed things up. Blevins takes a look and goes, yes, Bucky Barnes is at two cost when the soldier comes through. Yeah, Zero takes him down, locking the winter soldier in Warrior Falls for Blevins. A pass, looking for the big She-Hulk plays. Kibler here playing a Killmonger into the falls, takes out Zero. It's kind of like fuel for the fire at this point for the death. Yep, absolutely, because it's going to fall down to that Winter Soldier in the Warrior Falls battle. Can you imagine if this wasn't double armor? How much better Kibler's <laughs> looking right now? Ooh, okay, Red Skull into Sinister London. Let's yep. go. Time for some big stuff. <laughs> it feels really tough for Kibler to walk away with a win here. Red Skull. Uh, yeah. it, does, it does fall into the right place, I would say. For oh, okay. I take it all back. Arrow. Arrow. Blevins got prior here. Death for Kibler. Wait a second. If Kibler plays Arnim Zola onto Winter Soldier, is that enough to ever do anything? It'd be six to the middle plus two from the Red Skull. So that'd be eight you're getting on Sinister London. But the Titania locks that one up. Yeah, so... I think Kibler's just kind of done in this spot. I think that the Arm Zola was really the only out here. Um, it's, oh gosh, it's, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm watching his, his yeah, mouse go retreat. over the, the lock of the turn versus retreat. That was a close one for Kibler. I think the decision there to retreat, of course, uh, correct here. <laughs> so Blevins is going to take down another one as we head into round four. Oh, Maria, finally, we have the Deadpool <laughs> on the open. Are we just gonna get extra energy every single game this match? Project Pegasus first location. All right, uh, what zero red skull, I guess. Hand? I think that's a fine play. What do you think? <laughs> I'm gonna play a one power thing, and then I'll kill it. Ah. I, I know I said I wanted extra energy. I don't know if I wanted it to be quite this volatile, Maria. <laughs> Poor Kibler is like, oh, uh, yeah, uh, that is what your deck can do with a lot of energy. Unfortunately, mine can't have the fireworks here again. Okay, so, Another so Kibler, yes, Kibler does have ways to win this game now. You know, just pretty much it's it, a lot of it will boil down to how these duplicate over the course of the game. But this could be something that you're looking for. Oh, all right. Murder World. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Carnage. <laughs> Nova and Carnage into Sinister London. Where are the cards gonna go? Nova goes over to Murder World with Deadpool. Yes, we like it. Here pops the first Nova. Pump everybody up. 
Carnage again into Murder World. Oh, well, <laughs> that's a little sadder, but hey, <laughs> we got some value. Still looking pretty good though. Yeah, we got uh, two Deadpools in hand here and there's a snap, Kibler likes it. It's hard not to. And yeah. Venom too. Yeah, Blevins is like, I'm out. I saw, I saw wow. what's going on there. Turn one, zero Red Skull, retreat. Not good enough. I, you know, if you told me that wasn't good enough, I would be a little bit shocked. But Kibler showing it, us how it's done here as we get to high stakes, two cubes minimum here in round five. Another Deadpool in the opening, but not too much to surround it. So Kibler's draw is going to be very relevant to this one. Blevins finds a lizard early on, so something to do. But Blevins draw is missing all of the support pieces to really make this hand come together right now. And Morag here at the first location revealed a little sometimes for Blevins kind of Shuri deck to get in there. Depending on your draw, Bifrost, second location. So the thing that Kibler's going to fear here is going to be armor. But if your opponent has armor, it's just going to be a tough spot. So now Kibler has priority. You're not fearing the armor nearly as much. Oh, guess what? We have more energy. There's Tinkerer's Workshop. <laughs> location three. I mean, right? Kibler's just dodging armor left and right and center this game. I mean, this match, that's all <laughs> That's all I'd ever care about, basically. Yeah. I mean, that's just simply what it... In this Ooh. particular game, that's definitely what it boils down to. Check this out. We've got Carnage going to town there in the Bifrost. And Cosmo's like, oh! Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. <laughs> I'm late. Oh, armor! <laughs> wow, there's armor. A little late. To the, I mean, everyone's late to the party so far this, this game for Blevins. Yeah, for Kibler, pretty straightforward turn. And for Blevins, I think that the key here is going to be to try to find something into Morag, but I don't know if that's really anything that you can do. It's just... You know, there's, there's not really too much going on. So Glevin's kind of looking at that one going, ah, maybe I played this Cosmo in the wrong location. If he plays it to the right instead and Kibler doesn't greed the round, maybe the Cosmo gets something done that way. So a little bit of early sequencing that can really impact that. Yeah, now everything shifts over to the right from the Bifrost. Oh. Uh, 15 power for Kibler, but uh, Red Skull, happy to come on into the party in the middle. Kind of a tricky spot here for Kibler as well. It's like demon, you could like demon Deadpool Killmonger. Yeah, that's going to snap. Yeah, absolutely. You get the demon on the left as well, if you'd like. He's going to go for center. He says center is good enough. Here we go. Turn five. Deadpool into Tinkerer's Workshop Killmonger. Going to take out Deadpool yet again. Back to hand. It's eight power demon mid. Red Skull into mid. For Blevins, we've got six cubes on the line. Yeah, and for Kibler, this is looking great right now. Having two plays is so big with the Morag. And that's exactly what Blevins is taking into account right now. So Blevins says, you know what? I think I didn't get the mid lane done. Kibler has uh, priority, which means the Titania is five for free. Blevins <laughs> kind of shrugs and says, go. <laughs> 23 is sometimes a tie here, and I don't know if Taskmaster gets the job done on that. Kibler here. Oh, goodness. Laying down death. Kibler concedes the, the center lane, and that is just overkill on the right side. Wow, check this out. But oh, the Titania order. Five oh, the Titania order. The order. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I just didn't even take that into account. Yeah, five, not enough there in Morag. So Kibler is going to take that one down. Wow, On to round Mor six. Morag just really shakes things up so much. Murder World here, pretty nice spot for Kibler. Nova, though, is going to wait a little while longer in the negative zone. Yeah, one more turn for Deadpool to show up. You've Where's seen how powerful... Boy? Like the, the difference with Deadpool and without has just been massive so far. I gotta say the number one avatar I see on the ladder is Deadpool, not close. <laughs> From that bundle, everybody wants to be Deadpool. As I had mentioned uh, earlier in this tournament, I am an original art type of player. I still have the original avatar locked in. I don't understand you. <laughs> <laughs> I All my magic decks are completely foiled out. <laughs> like. 
My avatar is the Infinite. You know, the special foily cool version one. Yeah, man. Give me those shiny cards. You can have them. <laughs> okay, I'll take yours. That's fine. Oh, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Stark Tower, third location here. Yeah, Killer's got a pretty rough turn here. It's, he's got all the, the pieces to make sure that he can get the synergy rolling, but none of the... Nothing to eat! Yeah. Killmonger is going to be the best play for him this turn. Killing off that Nova, just pumping up Killmonger. Murder World goes off, nothing gets bonked. Cosmo in negative zone. Shuri right here for Blevins. Yeah, Blevins was anticipating, I think, something happening in the center lane that really put down a bunch of pieces right. and ate them all at once. And I think the Killmonger, it's not in a, in some, something they're not going to write home about, but honestly, it's kind of enough to get it done. Deadpool shows up. We're going to see if this can get enough done as well. It's a scary Shuri. spot for Brian, though. Yeah, absolutely. Shuri going off here. So, ball in Blevins' court, and it certainly needs to be there, uh, sitting on his final two life here. For Kibble, you can see what a big difference it is, too, like when you know what your opponent's deck is. Kibler knows that Blevins does not have Shang-Chi in the deck, so you can just load up this lane, all fear aside. Yeah, and there goes Venom, having a tasty snack. Ooh. Deadpool up to four. Arrow's gonna pull all him over, but not go. after Venom's already done his dirty work. Oh, and now this gets a little bit wacky. Is that gonna be stronger, or is Red Skull gonna be stronger? <laughs> Blevins is like... <laughs> Just hands in the air. Arnim Zola, take the wheel! Is 14 enough in my other locations? Blevins having priority is really the big difference, I think, on the thought of the plays says here you know what just you figure it out right <laughs> there you go this is what I, this is my best play go for it kibler here really thinking through what blevins would choose to do on this turn with that 14 power arrow left oh is he the oh he's gonna art of zola too <laughs> All right, the battle of the Artem Zola is here. <laughs> Kibler's like, yeah, all right, he got me. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that is not the outcome you want. Arrow's like, bye. <laughs> all right. Oh, that was great. Arrow that is was great. Such a powerful card, and it's just anytime something boils down to synergy, it feels like if you have Arrow and you have the lead, you can just steal all of that away. It's a beautiful, terrible thing. Here we are, round number seven. <laughs> Dream Dimension, another Stark Tower here for the players in middle. Yeah, nothing too crazy going on. Kibler's got a, a, a good enough hand to operate with. Levins has got the premier combo for this, which is going to be the Shuri plus the Red Skull, but have a little bit of a tricky play here sometimes. Not necessarily this time, though. He's going to steal away one of these two. Okay, sure. I'm fine with that. I already got it into the Winter Sol Soldier form. Final forming. So, Dream Dimension really mucking things up here as well. Where everything in Blevins' hand is going to cost one more. And so what do you actually do that puts this together? Yeah. yeah. When in doubt, Shuri, turn four. <laughs> Hood and Killmonger for Kibler. I think Blevins might have gotten gotten this one. Yeah, here we go. It's your turn five. You want to be playing that Red Skull, but you can't, like you said, because of Dream Dimension. So we're going to skip. So now Kibler oh, gets to have some fun here. Yeah, it's it's really tough to to see Kibler losing this game, honestly. Like, yeah, you see Blevins kind of mousing around Dream Dimension. This screwed me. Yeah, it's definitely one of those ones that can feel very prohibitive if your deck is pre-planned. All systems go. This is exactly why Kibler now just knows he needs to fight for basically one spot. Yeah, because you can. Red Skull, and then you can what? You can have a zero or Titania. Yeah, I think that you could reasonably use Titania for the for the ten, and then Red Skull. 
I think that's really one of the sure. only ways that, that Blevins could possibly walk away with a win here. It just it seems like it's tough to do. Oh, maybe you could tie? People are trying to figure mm. out what to do here as as is Blevins. Looks like it's gonna be the Red Skull order first, Titania second. Kibler's locked in. This is interesting. I kind of like the Titania on the left and play for the tiebreaker. Because you're getting 30 off of Red Skull. I don't know if that's enough, though. Levins is seeing Carnage here. Ooh, okay. Which means Titania takes the right lane. Oh, <gasps> unless the Wolverine flips. Oh, here, look at Kibler. He's like, go, go, you know where you need to go, bro. Oh, buddy, go! Oh! <laughs> wow! Blevins! Holy cow! Taking down that game with that Titanium to Machine World, and look at the relief on his face. It was not assured to go his way by any stretch of the imagination. <sighs> Round eight. This is it. Here we go. <laughs> I, I genuinely didn't think that card games could make me so nervous for both players. It's just Marvel Snap does. Oh yeah, it's sweaty. It's, it's sweaty. It's just truly a bizarre game. Final game here, Monster Island left mid the ice box. Looks like ice box had hit She-Hulk in that instance. On Blevin's side, Wolverine getting hit on Kibler's side. Kibler kind of going all in on the center lane here. Definitely don't blame him. Zero Titania now, for Blevins. Blevins is Pryo here, so this could be a really big deal. Oh, boy. Okay, here we go. Here that is we go. another huge draw here from we Blevins' go. side. Armor. <laughs> wow. Oh, there goes Armor. Kibler grimaces, but at least Wolverine didn't get caught in the crosshairs there. Shuri gets drawn. Okay, okay. So Blevins has some very powerful plays now where with She-Hulk in hand, you can get a lot of different things done. And so your options here are Shuri and watch what your draws are. It's Shuri skip five with She-Hulk arrow on the final turn. Or it would be skip this turn into Shuri She-Hulk and hope you can find a big power play. I think this is the one that boasts the most power just by itself. Oh my gosh. All right, so it's Killmonger last turn for Kibler there, giving him the win on Monster Island currently. So Shadowland taking care of those ninjas. If you arrow here and just draw to the right lane everything, and then you Arnim Zola, oh my good, this is this is like wildly strong. I'm curious how, how Kibler pieces this one together too, because I think a lot of the, the question for Kibler is, is when and how do you use the arrow? Looks like Kibler is interested in death this turn. Plopping down 12 power oh, to Shadowland. That's not the spot where Kibler wanted to see it. He gives up priority here. And there was wow. Arrow, and here comes Arnim Zola. Once again, Arnim Zola take the wheel. Blevins puts his hands into the air, says, do your worst, hopefully your best. Final turn of the final game. Let's see, Arnim Zola pops off. Arrow heads on over to the two other locations. Pulls him on over to Monster Island and one back into the middle into the ice box. And here's the Nero that's gonna pull that Arnold Zola back over a demon mid, and that's gonna give it to Blevins with the victory over Brian Kibler. My gosh, Arrow is just such a powerful card. The Shuri following up with it, and then the Arnold Zola boasting its power at the end as well. It's like, why it's such a powerful option? But really, I think what this shows is kind of the, the power that armor brings to the table. I, th I feel like this is a card that was intended to simply protect your own cards. And instead, what it's doing is it's neutralizing your opponent's plays oh, yeah. simultaneously with that. The, the, the destroy decks, they're very powerful, but the moment they get disrupted, things can get completely thrown off track. And every single game, it felt like armor was just a critical card when it showed up early. I absolutely love armoring a destroy player's lane. It is just, oh, 
almost no better feeling in Snap than that. Uh, and we saw it on Showcase here in this game. So that is Kibler, unfortunately, out of the tournament. But we've got more Snap. Don't go anywhere. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Infinity Gauntlet. Marie Bartholdi and Moni Davuti here with you. Casting some snap games. It's it's a great day. Any day you can cast some snap games, watch some awesome players. And we are here in the winner's bracket. We've got Raven versus Dara coming up for you, everybody. Let's kick it off with Raven's deck. Moni, what do you think about this list? This list is weird. I can't really come up with a better word. Uh, it's essentially an on-reveal deck. You see Wong, you see Odin, you see Dr. Doom and White Tiger, all the pieces that we're used to seeing from on-reveal decks. But then there's some spicy inclusions. The primary one that I'm looking at is, of course, Invisible Woman alongside Rock Slide in this deck. Rock Slide, not a card that we've seen too much of recently outside of synergizing with Dark Hawk. But here, it looks like Raven's playing it purely to clutter up the opponent's deck. I mean, I love it. Invisible Woman, hide your iron heart till the end of the game, double it with Wong, and then, I don't know, Odin? I, it, it could be very, very explosive, Monty. It, it definitely could be. You could definitely bait your opponents, of course, with this being open deckless now that we're in the second round. Dara is going to have a good idea of what is going on from Raven's side, and I see a card in Dara's deck that is ready to say no to this invisible woman. Dara is packing a Cosmo. Yeah, this is pretty typical fare for a Shuri deck. We do see, of course, uh, the Zero Titania one, one drop package alongside tech cards like both Armor and Cosmo. Uh, the big difference we see in this version compared to some of the other lists we've seen is rather than Captain Marvel or Arnim Zola, the extra five drop or big card that this deck is packing is Vision. So you're giving yourself the option to go Shuri into Vision on turn five, and then you have free reign to move it while following it up with an arrow plus taskmaster or whatever you wish uh so it's some amount of flexibility we've seen this as a way of trying to juke opposing arrows because a lot of people are packing arrow these days uh no arrow notably from raven's deck but still having the flexibility of the vision is quite nice Right, here we go, Raven on the top of your screen, and we've got Dara on the bottom. By the way, we're joining this match in progress because Raven forgot to hit record on OBS. You know, happens to the best of us. So. Yeah. <laughs> Dara took down round one for two cubes, so we do yep. see an eight uh, to ten disadvantage here for Raven. Uh, but does have um, the Thor here for turn three, no turn two play, unfortunately. So Raven is going to miss out on curving out a bit. On the other side, Dara has a zero, but nothing to follow it up. So a bit of a liability to play it, considering your next play might end up being Shuri or Shuri. nothing until turn five. Right, you just can't do it blind. You just can't. There's Thor in the big house for Raven. Iceman currently sitting in the Hellfire Club as well. No plays yet for Dara. Uh, how do you feel with your first play being on turn four if you're Dara, Moni? It, it's not ideal, uh, but feeling pretty good about She-Hulk being your play into Big House, considering Big House will protect it from the Shang-Chi that you know your opponent has. Uh, one thing I would consider in Dara's position is swapping around the order, perhaps, and if you're planning on playing a one-drop, playing the one-drop into She-Hulk, just to give yourself the option to Taskmaster the next turn. Uh, but it looks like Dara has no plans of playing a one-drop anyways, perhaps hoping to save that zero into Titania play for later. Uh, but as things stand, I would really be tempted to be playing She-Hulk into Big House just because of the existence of Shang-Chi and Raven's set. All right, there's Scorpion into the Big House for Raven. She-Hulk goes to Hellfire Club as well as the Invisible Woman that we are so interested to see how Raven ends up using in this match. Yeah, Invisible Woman, I believe that's a White Tiger being hidden behind it, if I saw correctly. Uh, and Raven does have the Odin uh, follow-up here. It is, in fact, a White Tiger. Uh, so could just go for that. Doesn't have priority, so has to be worried somewhat about Cosmo. That may be a reason for Raven to just go Doctor Doom in Necrotia instead. That would give him a tie in Hellfire Club at best against the She-Hulk, so it's a little risky. Uh, and 
I think that's something that Raven has to be careful of here because Dara just playing Arrow here is going to be quite strong. And that's a snap from Dara as well here heading into the final turn. Tapmaster previous turn copied that She-Hulk in Necrotia and here's the arrow that you mentioned. Yeah, it does look like because Dara is not playing anything else to Hellfire Club, or at least not yet, Dara should play, I believe, a one drop to Hellfire Club. But if Dara doesn't, uh, then Raven will have a tie there. And that means that the stats uh, that get added to uh added from the white tiger don't matter if they go to big house or necrotia once there's a tie on hellfire club so with dara not playing anything to hellfire club before now uh it was a bit of a gamble you can see dara actually trying out several different lines of play here on this final crucial turn locking it in finally with lizard zero and titania into the big house yeah, and this is going to be a tie on the right lane uh, for Raven, a tie in the middle lane. So wherever this tiger goes, that's a complete tie. A tie across the board. Both players got to laugh at that. All right. Well, I guess that one didn't matter. But we're, get, we're getting another round, a low stakes round out of the way, I guess. <laughs> You see Raven shaking his head because that was a 50-50. If the tiger goes yeah. in the middle lane, not only is it bigger because it's not shrunk by Necrotia, but it also shrinks the opponent's lizard. So Raven just had a straight up 50-50 from the white tiger to win two cues there rather than tie. And unfortunately, when you're the player behind and each round you're getting closer towards round five, which is the high stakes round, uh, that's a rough place to be. You see Dara snapping turn one because Shuri plus Red Skull are in hand. Raven doesn't have a draw to try to keep up with that yeah and uh raven's just gonna retreat there in round number three giving the victory to dara yet again no wins yet in raven's machine world the first location here in round number three yeah, honestly, having Cosmo, Dara could get aggressive and just snap again, try to force Raven onto the back foot. If you can force your opponent to retreat one by one as you get closer to round five and those high stakes rounds, that's really in your advantage. So Dara having the primary counter card to Raven's deck here, it may be some motivation to snap more aggressively. But of course, with just Taskmaster and Titania in hand before this, you're still lacking some of the pieces to really assemble your whole game plan together. Vibranium Mines and Nidavelli are the other two locations that were revealed. And here comes Cosmo into the right lane for Dara. Playing Cosmo aggressively is a little ambitious if you're in Dara's seat. Your game plan hasn't come together at all yet. You don't have Sherry, you don't have Red Skull. And Cosmo is a very powerful counter to what Raven's doing because Raven has to telegraph a Wong lane. So right. as long as you hold on to this Cosmo. <laughs> but I mean, that's also telegraphed. Yeah, as long as you hold on to this Cosmo, you feel like you're in a good position. You have some counterplay. And once you let it go, you're at the whimsies of wherever Raven decides to drop the White Tiger, the Wong, the Odin, etc. It ended up being armor into Netta Valier, followed by Rock Slide from Raven. Now it looks like Dara's interested potentially in this Cosmo. Raven, though, is going to snap. Yeah, Raven has the priority here, and I don't think Dara has. It, because that cost was not on the board and you don't have priority, you have no counterplay. But there was no real way for Dara to get priority. Yep, and that's going to be a retreat from Dara after that snap from Raven into high stakes round here with round number five. Yeah, and now playing for two cubes minimum, and this does benefit the player who is ahead. So Dara got the one snap retreat there, nine to seven still. So Dara's sitting pretty here, ahead by two cubes. Armor into Wakandan Embassy that pumped up everything in the player's hands. Scorpion for Raven to shrink things back. Dara is well aware of the Killmonger in Raven's deck, so wanted to make sure to get the armor down before going for this zero Titania play. There was a good chance that you were going to have priority anyways, so you could have potentially baited Raven into the Killmonger and have the armor beforehand. But this is just the safe play, Dara, playing it in this order. It means that suddenly you have 13 power on a lane, adding a Sunspot onto that as well, nice. and nice. Raven can do nothing about it. 
Yeah, that Wakandan embassy is looking pretty good for Dara right now. Thor went into Fist Tower for Raven there. By the way, there's an arrow in hand, Dara, and we've got a Fisk on board. Yeah, Dara has arrow in deck and in hand. Raven, neither. De not in the deck, not in the hand. So the question here is, what will Dara do? Has an option to just go Red Skull and then follow it up with it arrow next turn has an option to play vision into fist tower this turn and then be able to move it into kunlun to get the buff from that and potentially dodge a shang chi but as things stand it looks like the snap is going to resolve raven is going to say i'm going to play for this and Whew. with raven is seven health if if this goes through this is going to be the full game yeah this is dangerous red skull into the middle for Dara, four cubes on the line. Cosmo into Fisk Tower is the consideration for Dara. Also thinking about Arrow mid. Wow, th that is a line that loses to Shang-Chi. That is a line that beats Shang-Chi. I, I can see why the Cosmo into Fisk Tower was attempting try to prevent an Odin. But if you're about to place anything into the middle lane, you are just going to lose. So it, this is at least the line that protects you. And I think this is the line that could get the job done. Of course, Raven has played two things here. So the Red Skull will be buffing them. Uh, one of them is Shang-Chi. Uh, that's seven power. The other is invisible no. one. It is still enough. So that gets the job done here. All right, Raven picking up that four. Was that, oh, that was a huge one for Raven there, picking up that map. Wow, Dara, just a huge chunk of life into the dumpster. This is this match has certainly swung back around in Raven's favor. Yeah, anytime a seven cuber or eight cuber uh, in, in normal cases resolves in battle mode, it is very much a swinging things around. Dara tries to snap, but. Of course, unable to because only has two life to play with here. Uh, Raven still has the seven that he had the previous round. So now the question is, who has the better hand with Lamentis? Dara feeling pretty good. Does have Shuri into a powerful card in Vision into Arrow. So sort of has the full curve. On the other side, Raven has a Shang-Chi to answer whatever gets shuri if there is one. But you're fighting against an armor as well. So... Dara sort of has everything for this Lamentus game. That is actually very, that's like incredible <laughs> that he's able to have all, the perfect suite of cards here after Lamentus blew up the decks. And there's armor, just like you said, heading into Lamentus to protect whatever uh, Shang-Chi might, or excuse me, Shuri might be interested in pumping up. Yeah, we see the beauty of Thor in a Lamentus game. Put Mjolnir in an empty deck, draw it immediately. So that's just the basically free uh, three cost, 10 power unit. So Thor extremely strong here. Raven able to deploy uh, an Iron Heart and just get some buffs on Mjolnir as well as the two existing units. But seeing the Shuri come down, Raven already knows with that armor down that he has lost a lane most likely. He is not going to be able to fight everything. The question is, can he beat this vision into arrow? Yep, here comes vision for Dara right into Stark Tower. Is going to get that buff after this turn. White Tiger for Raven sends the tiger into Lamentus. Raven, oof, is like, okay, that's a pretty big vision. <laughs> Yeah, you can feel the pain for Raven facing off in a Lamentus game, knowing that your opponent has limited resources and still being hit with essentially their best two card combo in the spot, which is Shuri plus Vision to get the buff and move the Vision into safety. Uh, the problem for Dara is... What do you do here? Th then what? Right? Right? You've got Arrow and Ironheart in hand. Arrow, it looks like, is going to be locked into the Daily Bugle. There for Dara. Raven. Pull on over. Hoping that this is enough, but six is not oh. going to be enough to get the job wow. done. The vision moving. Dara etching it out by one means that Dara deals two damage, but that's the saving grace for Raven is because he had such a life total advantage. Raven still has five cubes to work with. Dara sitting at just two means that at minimum, this game is for Raven to lose, he needs to lose three more times. All right, here we go. Round number seven. Can Dara win out 
Sunspot mid here is gonna kick things off as well as an Iceman that's gonna hit Titania from Raven. Hey, that was the best option for Terra. Dara, you really don't care about Titania getting hit there. But sure, getting hit would have been huge as it would have prevented you from doing the lines that you want to do. Like Shuri on turn four, skip turn five, go She-Hulk, Taskmaster on turn six. Just one of the many options that this deck has access to. So really big for Dara to dodge that Iceman on the Shuri there. There's Lizard, Sakaar, the revealed location. <laughs> I heard you make a noise there, Monty. Yeah, Sakaar is one of the locations that can actually really mess up this Shuri deck. There's no Taskmaster here, so you're not going to get max punish. And Titania getting pulled out, one of the better options here is this not the card you wanted to get hit by Shuri, but all the same, you do now have Titania on board that your opponent can play into, and that is a bit of a liability in terms of stats that have been given away for free. Shuri into Atlantis, Ironheart there for Raven is going to give some some buffs around to the team yeah i think it, dara is going to understand that raven needs to play into the sakar lane this turn so going to play the vision there past the titania hot potato over expecting to get it back alongside having a 14 power vision and dara back against the wall is playing this game so so tight so far i love titania as a hot potato <laughs> take it take this and now Vision free to roam here for Dara as we enter the final turn here of round seven. Yeah, Raven has a big question mark here of, do I expect Dara to think I'm playing to Sakaar and play here? Because if Raven expects Dara to play to Sakaar and pass Titania over, he could have played Doctor Doom to any other lane and kept the Titania. But if he thinks Dara's not going to play there, then Raven has played Doctor Doom there now. And if Dara plays this She-Hulk there, Raven will get punished for the choice. Dara once again reading the situation correctly, and that means going to get the Titania back. And that's another two cues being knocked <laughs> off of Raven. Wow, what a great game here from Dara, staying alive, heading into the next round of our battle here in the winner's bracket. Dara is playing this game so well, just making the right decision at every point. You see the decision to play the vision there, pass the Titania over, and every time he's been rewarded by reading exactly how Raven is going to play around the Titania that Dara didn't even want to play, was forced into it by the Sakaar. All right, here we go. Round number eight. Sunspot mid here for Dara kicking things off. District X, though, is going to mess stuff up for the players. You see both of the reactions. Oof. Armor mid for Dara, and there's Scorpion. But here we go. Things are going to get weird. Based on hands alone, Raven definitely got the better end of this exchange, uh, <laughs> especially now finding a rocket raccoon uh, <laughs> as something to play here. Hey, you can't really run out an Iron Heart considering you only have one thing to buff and there's no Odin or there's probably no yeah, Odin in your probably. deck uh, to oh, trigger no. this Iron Heart again. <laughs> oh God, I love a District X. It really makes it. Both players are now honest. It's now an honest game of snap. <laughs> Just an honest game of snap. It's not much, but it's honest snap. <laughs> Rock slide hitting the vault for Raven Scorpion there from Dara off of the District X. Gets a Nick Fury, a Ghost Rider, and an Enchantress? Okay. All right, so Raven is expecting that Dara is going to play to the vault this turn, try to break up this tie. So he's going to play Spider-Man to Atlantis. Oh, basically lock up that lane short of something like a Heimdall coming out from Dara to just move everything. So this incredible, this really weird. Incredible. <laughs> and Thanos too coming down here for Dara. Oh my god, you love to see it. <laughs> Thanos adding nonsense. 11 here. Raven is playing a White Tiger, but this is a 50-50. If the White Tiger doesn't go to the vault, Raven's going to lose this game. Oh, yeah, there it goes to Atlantis. Atlantis! Ant-Man in District X. Dara is still alive here in this round. Incredible. And notably against the Thanos, it actually didn't matter where the White Tiger went. Dara did still have the tiebreaker covered after the tie. So now from seven 
it, what was 7-2, uh, it looks like, to 1-2. This is for everything. This is for all the marbles here. For these players in the winner's bracket want to keep on winning, get to that championship match. Camp High and Nowhere, the first two locations. We're going to put a Lizard mid for Dara, Scorpion right for Raven. Nowhere is pretty nice for Dara. Has a location. Oh, that's that's heartbreaking. Has a location that is protected uh, from potential Shang-Chi's. And now with the Super Flow, Raven having played blind into it, getting absolutely punished. Now Dara can just go Shuri into Camp High. Follow it up with a Red Skull in Nowhere that he knows is protected. And then a Taskmaster. It, oh, this is... The last few rounds, everything has just been working out for Dara. Yeah, this is the deck really showing its stuff. The Shuri deck shining here. Red Skull, like you mentioned, into Nowhere. Feeling completely safe from any Shang-Chi shenanigans. What does Raven do? It's tough because all of the cards that you currently have access to, they're not fighting on the right axes against what Dara is presenting. And more importantly, normally you would like to use the lane where your opponent plays Red Skull as the lane where you may play White Tiger because you're branching out your power playing the one power there. But unfortunately for Raven, because it's nowhere, he can't play White Tiger into the middle lane. So now it's a 50-50 as to whether if he goes for White Tiger even, he might not be able to afford to. If he goes for White Tiger, if the Tiger goes into the middle, that's completely useless. He's not able to contest that lane. Absolutely right. And there is where the Tiger Spirit ends up. Raven just has to give a little laugh there as Taskmaster copies Red Skull. 28 points, giving Dara a huge lead left and mid and arrow is going to try and ensure things here in the super flow yeah dara has the priority has the arrow has the armor protected against shang chi way too many stats for dr doom and this match looked incredibly good for raven we have to go back to that second round where raven had a 50 50 for that white tiger to either tie the game and win the game it was a tie so dara didn't lose two cubes there and Raven just knows it's over and retreats, doesn't even play out the last turn. And that's it. Wow, that is Dara taking down the match against Raven. Dara will advance in the winner's bracket, but don't worry, Raven fans. Out of it just yet, going to drop down into the loser's bracket and switch to his second deck. What an incredible match. That one was really fun, Monty. We've got more Snap. Don't go anywhere. The Infinity Gauntlet presented by 983 Media. I'm Nathan Zamora, AKA That's Admirable. I'm joined by Monty Davuti in this one. We have Casanova versus Tia Beastie coming up in this one. And the decks aren't too wacky on both sides. Uh, one of them looks pretty straightforward, Monty, but the other one is looking a little bit interesting to me. Yeah, starting off with Casanova, this is the deck of the format. I think everybody is sort of in agreement. This is the Thanos Lockjaw deck that has been terrorizing basically everything, tournaments, <laughs> ladder, whatever you would like, this deck has just been absolutely on top of it. And in the deck itself, really no surprises. We see all the pieces that we have gotten used to seeing from this Thanos Lockjaw deck. Of course, the big key players here, the Quinjet giving you those explosive draws, Lockjaw giving you those explosive plays, and Leech to really limit what your opponent can do as counterplay, has just time and time again proven to be such an incredible combination of cards that just doesn't really fail. So Casanova feeling pretty good about their deck here. Yeah, and on Tia's side, we do have a Lockjaw deck, but it's looking a little bit different to me because A, I'm not seeing Thanos, and B, I'm seeing a lot of uh, different combinations, but nothing, that, again, that's like super surprising here, just a lot of different kinds of strong plays. Yeah, this feels old school. This is an old school on reveal Lockjaw deck. You do, of course, see Odin uh, with Wong here and ways to take advantage of that, like 
Dr. Doom if you can cheat one of the six cost cards into play early with Lockjaw, but you also see the zero cost package. So there's a Wasp here, normally a big piece of non-Thanos Lockjaw decks, but you also see Thor plus the mighty Thor with Jane Foster being able to pull Mjolnir out of your deck, pull Wasp out of your deck, and really fuel that Lockjaw engine that we have seen from decks like this in the past. There isn't really anything surprising here. I think the spiciest card in the deck might just be Yondu, which is... It, I guess pretty cool for disrupting what your opponent is doing, especially if you can get Wong into play, maybe loop it a few times with Lockjaw, maybe oh. that adds up. So there is a little bit of spice here in Tia's deck, along with maybe not the most common fare these days, but it is something that we have seen before in Snap. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this matchup and see whose Lockjaw is going to lock things up here as we're still in the winner's bracket. It's the second round of that, which means the deck lists are open. You know exactly what your opponent's playing. You know the tools that are available, unless you're running something like uh, your Skelly or Mystery Deck. So here we go, kicking things off. I, there's one complaint I would like to file specifically to Ben Brode on this one, which is... Uh, that Mjolnir does not buff Jane Foster, and I am very upset by this. Yeah, I think that is a very fair complaint. The Mighty Thor is still a Thor. Indeed it is, Ben. Literally in the art. I'm going to take this up with him personally. We'll, we'll, figure, <laughs> we'll figure this out. <laughs> File this complaint directly <laughs> it, it, to the man himself. Tia's got a nice curve here, just a... Uh, playing out your stuff as your energy comes along. A one, a two, and a three. Casanova, meanwhile, has a Lockjaw, but has had no prior plays yet. So this Lockjaw, a little bit slow, but maybe it's enough to get the job done here. Nothing in Tia's hand really countering that, I would say. But they are, it looks like uh, Tia is going to lock up Asgard, which is, I think, a really big benefit because really the main feature of this deck is finding the pieces that you need. Yeah, and oh, <gasps> no, no, oh, no. No. no, Agatha, what are you doing? Ben, I have another complaint I would like to file. Oh, that is disaster. Uh, Casanova, at... Casanova has to know something is up now when you see the Wasp Wong. You have to know something just went horribly, horribly wrong. Leech, I think, is a detriment for Casanova right now. It, it absolutely is, because right now, Tia is still winning that middle lane and is going to be winning harder with this Mjolnir. If Leech had come down, Tia would get to choose where to move her vision. Tia would get to choose where to play Agatha. So now <laughs> you are... Oh, my gosh. Oh, no. There's only Wait. two power on the left lane. Is there oh, any no. way? Is there any way that Tia wins this? It would require Casanova to make a really huge mistake by going down too many oh, cards in hand. Reality Stone draws a card. So it's, I don't think it's happening for Tia. So the location could matter here and what could. lock draw actually draws here is going to matter. Oh my it, gosh, Tia can win. Okay. Oh my gosh, Tia can win. Okay, location changes. What is this? It's a mind stone. Tia did win. Oh my gosh, Agatha! <laughs> Casanova says Agatha. Tia just shrugs. Two cubes to Miss Harkness. What on earth? D did Casanova just get blown away by what happened in the center lane and they just weren't fo like what? What actually happened there? That was, you know, it felt reasonable from Casanova's point of view and what they were doing. It's just, you aren't counting on Agatha. Casanova's still confused. All right. I, first, I want to resend my complaint on Agatha to Ben Brode. And then secondly, I I just, I'm still blown away. I cannot believe that Agatha won a game. Just 14 power. It's like a, it's like the bad Shuri draws at the end. Yeah, th this is a tournament. We are, we are playing a tournament right now. It, you know, first of all, let's, let's just back it up. Oh. It, credit to Tia for just staying in the game because there was no pressure on her. <laughs> just being like, all right, Agatha, take the wheels. Oh, my, <laughs> my Wong is in a locked lane. All right, cool. Oh, there goes my Wasp. Okay, cool. And then 
just getting it done anyways, not retreating at the end, not going like, oh, I, I'm definitely losing here. Incredible. Wow. All right, we're kicking things off with uh, a pretty non-effect uh, location thing that's going on, aside from the Hellfire Club kind of restricting the place. But Raft now gets locked up very early by Casanova in this one. Sunspot is the main defense that's going to take there. So Tia does have some plays that she can make onto the Raft to try and fight for other spots in this one. But Casanova with a snap on, the, uh, on turn three there, not surprising to see when you're going to be able to lock up the Raft but Tia's going to stick this one out and say, you know what? I think that I can still fight for this one. Yeah, the raft is locked up. Of course, there is still the sunspot growing and the soul stone oh. is there. Uh, but this is a little tough here because there's currently no Dr. Doom from Tia. You can play to try to find Dr. Doom. Uh, you do see Tia going for the mighty Thor, not playing the wasp this turn, just saving it in case Tia does end up drawing Lockjaw out of the deck, but there are no other zero cost cards to draw here. All right, Tia's gone. <laughs> Tia's got some other things to do right now. Yeah. Magneto, big play here as well, just completely taking out the Wong options on the right lane, but it is tied in the right lane in terms of power right now. So Casanova still got a little bit to figure out here. Like I don't, I don't say this is like a like a necessarily like a super win, one hundred percent of the time. You know, I have to go go through and pour over the hands here, but I just I was so fixated on the previous game that it's like. My gosh, but I mean, I don't know. She-Hulk Odin is a lot of power on board. It's a lot of power, and you still have the right lane tied. Like, you are asking Thea to, step one, win one of these two lanes where you have 14 and 20 power, right? That's step one for Thea. Step two has to win by okay. enough that she's overcoming the tie. It's just not happening. Casanova knows it. So to right. see, of course. Yeah, that, that is the retreat. You, you kind of stick around through the snap, and that's just what's going to happen sometimes. The benefit of snapping early is when your opponent is forced to retreat, you've already locked in that extra cube. Yeah, this Thanos deck is so good at filling up the raft as well. So one of the locations, as if this deck needed any help, one of the locations <laughs> that really, really helps the Thanos deck is the raft. Being able to fill it, not only that, but sometimes having the space stone as well. So being able to fill it and then open up a slot in it, just extremely powerful series of plays for the Thanos deck. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think the Thanos deck did need a little bit of help. You know, it's it's kind of struggling. You got all these extra cards in your deck. You know, that's one of the things that we hate to do in card games is put extra cards in your deck. Yeah, it's just it's just a downside. <laughs> All right, Tia's draw really slow. There's a Wong, there is a Lockjaw, but you have nothing to follow up this Lockjaw right now. Your Mighty Thor doesn't have a Mjolnir to pull, just a Wasp to pull there. And notably, Casanova being very mindful of not playing into Kamertage, not getting maximum value from these stones. Tia does have priority here, is going to accept the idea that Wong is... Uh, the stronger play than playing it through Lockjaw at the moment. Yeah, but this arrow is going to take full advantage. Wong into Warrior Falls. Yep. Goodbye. So no quadruple Doctor Doom for Tia. Not the end of the world, but not ideal here. My gosh, that's just four energy down the drain. Oh, Tia, though, with a Wasp drawn, that could be a big deal. Wasp could definitely be a big deal. You can play Wasp this turn and then... Mighty Thor. Mighty Thor will kill off Arrow on that left lane. There is now a bit of a sequencing error here. Tia should play Wasp first because if you pull oh. Thor out of the deck with Lockjaw, you do want to get the uh, Mjolder into your hand. You could have drawn this Wasp out of your deck. So a slight sequencing error here for Tia, but ultimately with the Doctor Doom available here as well, Tia does still have some plays. The big problem is you're losing in the middle wow. lane. Your left lane is not a guarantee because you know the opponent has access to America Chavez in the Thanos deck, and you're limited by space on the right lane. Wow, this is actually a really big deal too because if you have Wasp in your hand, you can play the Wasp on to Lockjaw, hope that gets the job done, arrow the center lane to try to draw the attention there, and perhaps lock up a win. This could be a major difference in this one. Like now that I'm looking at the hand, this actually might be a retreat instead. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think, based on what she has, Thea should be staying in this game. I think that your window has passed to really compete with what your opponent's presenting. You have three lanes, none of which are a guarantee, uh, two of which are almost certainly losses. Wow, that is a big difference. It's 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 crazy to look at this too because it's oftentimes those little tiny things that that mean the world when it comes to these tournament games and it's not often that they're going to add up this way. It's just that when they do, they're so massively different. Tia's going to stick around and that's minus two cubes on this one. It looks like, oh, there's two dooms. No, that's not nearly enough. Two dooms, both gone because they are still tied for the lowest power warrior falls and Unfortunately, that is pretty big. Two more damage being taken by Tia. We are not in high stakes yet, so any sort of lead that Casanova can mount here is going to be huge going into turn five forward. Wow. Or pretty crazy. Round that five. A, a wasp into uh, a Jane Foster instead of a Jane Foster into a wasp. I think it, that's such a, a big amount of percent that's being sacrificed there. But we're on to the next one. Big house to kick things off. So Big House, I feel like, is one of those lanes where when I see it, I always want to fight for it very early to make sure I can lock up the advantage here. Yeah, absolutely. It's it, One of the big things with Big House is if you can land something like a Sunspot there and you know that your opponent doesn't have a Killmonger, for example, <laughs> their only avenue of attacking this and fighting this is the Shang-Chi. So if this Sunspot hypothetically grows large enough, Shang-Chi still can't answer it. And that's a really valuable card to have in a location like this. Are you going to go for a Yondu, which takes out a Magneto? That's a big benefit. Meanwhile, Casanova's hand is purely stones. He is assembling the gauntlet very quickly. Oh, Sinister that's London. That's not good for Casanova. <laughs> you are going to run out of board space very quickly. And one of the big things actually is... Devil Dinosaur in Sinister London, putting a copy in Isle of Silence is not that good. Early Leech. Early Leech is very good. Yeah, we'll we'll take those. And Casanova just going to play purely for board value here as well. Says Leech onto the Sinister London is going to be enough. Yep. Snap. I can't blame anyone for that. Yeah, Casanova having that Leech here on turn four, knowing that at best Tia could play a Wonk, if Wong goes in Sinister London, okay, the second copy is going in Isle of Silence. That doesn't do anything. And yes, Tia does have the big house locked up here, but now it's going to be purely a game of stats. And that's not the worst game for Tia. She would just rather be playing it with Dr. Doom's available. And by the way, Castova's going to get the Ooh. show and tell here. Hold on. Oh, oh, wait, ongoing disabled onto Isle of Silence. Yeah, see, if that second arrow had gone into Isle of Silence and pulled the first Devil Dinosaur also into Isle of Silence, that would have completely changed this game. That was a 50-50 oh for Tia to have an incredible position versus a disastrous position. So Casanova just won a huge coin flip in that spot. Well, from Tia's side also, you could technically just play the arrow on Isle of Silence. You could, you just don't know that your opponent is playing Devil Dinosaur specifically yeah, against anything else. That doesn't look so good. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of things to account for there, which is like the, the most powerful plays, because again, we're on open deck list right now. Some of the most powerful plays that Casanova is going to have here. Blue are yeah, Blue Marvel, Devil Dinosaur. We've already seen the leech come down. Like, I yeah. feel like there's a lot of justification for Arrow into Isle of Silence here and try to take that down. All right, the merit was there, but unfortunately it doesn't quite get the job done. We're into high stakes, and Casanova, that was another game that they won with an early snap, so now a four-cube lead into high stakes is a fantastic place to be. Tia has got the classic opening hand right now. It's Sunspot, it's Weight, it's Lockjaw Wasp, and see what ends up happening here. This is the great hand. The biggest problem for Tia is there are a lot of cards in this deck that are not great to lockjaw out early. If you lockjaw out a Yondu, that's not ideal. If you lockjaw out an arrow, that's not ideal. That was a snap from Tia. 
Yeah, I don't. Bl- the the Thor really is to me one of the big game changers of this. Like when I see Thor in this spot, I, I think I'm very willing to to snap with this Lockjaw in hand. Yeah, definitely. You now have Lockjaw into double zero cost plays, and if you hit the Mighty Thor, if you don't draw that next turn, then that could be huge. Of course, you do have to draw the Mjolnir, but still more options available for you. For, for TM, really, my only question so far in this game is the Iceman on turn two. Is is that worth holding because you have Lockjaw, because you have Wasp? Yeah, it, it's an interesting question because from TS point of view, you really want to Lockjaw on turn three before you draw this Thor. Oh, this could be a big deal, too. With Now, now you get to duplicate the Wasp from Cloning Vats if you want. Yeah, the Doom drawn is unfortunate. That was one of the better hits left in your deck for the Lockjaw. Your Lockjaw is getting worse, but you have an extra Lockjaw hit with that Wasp. There is diminishing returns to playing multiple Wasps because one Lockjaw, putting a Wasp in can just pull a Wasp out. But ultimately, you're in a position where you're behind, so you need to take the risk anyways and hope that you hit. All right, this game snapped up. It's from... Oh! <laughs> That's the Mjolnir and the second Wasp. That was the hit. Oh, oh my gosh. That was the hit. Okay. Okay, this game's getting crazy now. With Tia having priority here as well, that means there's nothing that necessarily shuts off the plays from the other side. So Tia has access to arrow and multiple zero costs. Yeah, and... Casanova is just going to pass, hoping to go She-Hulk plus a five drop next turn. But notably, even if Casanova had had space, which they don't, they would have just drawn America Chavez. So there's no arrow from the other side. There is no interaction in terms of messing up where the plays go. Of course, Shang-Chi is able to shoot down this Thor if it gets too big from a Mjolnir coming down. So this is going to be a decent amount of mind games of who blinks first because Casanova will ultimately still have priority next turn. He says arrow now. Do you play any of the zero drops? I think the answer is no. I think that you can play them after. Yeah. Wow. All right. Okay. This... So, oh, you have Odin as well. Holy smokes. Realistically, Casanova knows that this Thor is going to grow this turn. So you want to contest it with a Shang-Chi or let that lane go completely. That's step one. Step two, if you're Tia, you want to play Mjolnir in Comertage, I would assume, and drop double Wasp as cloning bats. Yeah, there it is. Okay, Casanova... It, Casanova is thinking about, oh, going back on it. It, it looked like it was going to be She-Hulk and Comertage, Shang-Chi and Hellfire Club, but reconsidering. I think Tia's thinking about Shang-Chi in particular and how you make sure that you beat that. And Doctor Doom kind of gets that done in, in the right lane. But a yeah. lot of things get that done in the right lane. I feel like, ah, this is this is kind of weird. I feel like that, that Tia had some options here and is really considering the right lane a bit too much. All right. Well, Thea does need to hit some stats here, and it doesn't look like she's going to. So I think Thea won the Hellfire Club and none of the other lanes, unfortunately. Well, can this draw anything relevant? It's another Mjolnir. There's no Iron Hearts. Mjolnir does not buff the Mighty Thor, despite your former complaint file to Ben Brode. And I think... That's going to get the job done here. Wow. Tia taking a couple big hits in this match. In particular, Casanova walks away. Eight cubes left in the bank for that one. Casanova getting it done with Thanos. It's just been such a strong deck for such a long time. And I think that matches like this kind of boast the power that it really holds. You're sacrificing some amount of consistency for power. But frankly, the consistency still feels like it's there. The deck is just so good. And, you know... We know there's a nerf coming. We we should say, we know there's a nerf coming to the deck. We don't know what it is, but everybody realizes at this point the deck is too strong. And we're seeing why. We see the power level of just how flexible your plays are with Quinjet, with She-Hulk. Just cost reduction is so good. 
And we saw Casanova prove why. It, it is indeed that way. Tia is not out of the tournament yet, just yet. She, she drops down to the loser's bracket in this one. Casanova is going to move on uh, as we continue through this one. At this point, it is open deck lists. So Tia is going to have to swap to her secondary deck. Your opponents will know what that is as we continue to move through this one. So we got more Marvel Snap, so stay tuned. Stay tuned. 